screen and desktop one. Share. Can you see the presentation on the screen, guy? Yeah, no, as no, yet? no, not yet. No, no, not yet, not yet. Okay, let me just see. Okay, let's see if I can. How do I get the share screen? Sir, below uh, laptop, in the middle, we have a share screen option, green color. Yeah, I've just seen it. I'm just trying to get my presentation on that hmm. yeah you need to have the presentation minimized first before you share screen i've got the presentation yeah. here yeah we have so, you are on uh, okay, okay fine mm -hmm. so shall i start just go into a presentation mode that's all yeah just uh, just full screen yeah full screen. no no before you start you need to be introduced to people so uh, dr Shri, uh, dr dwarka will start now okay thank you so much as you can see, I'm working from home today. <laughs> uh, good evening, all the participants and family faculty member. On the behalf of Intas Pharmaceutical, our Dr. Pragna Patil would like to take the opportunity to welcome everyone on this symposia on centromic craniosynostosis and cranial facio-maxillary distraction technique. To enlighten our knowledge, we have our eminent faculties with us. Without taking much time, I take the opportunity to welcome and introduce our moderator of this virtual symposia, Dr. Dwarkanath Srinivas. Dr. Dwarkanath Srinivas is a department uh, at, uh, the professor and head at the Department of Neurosurgery in Nidhams, Bangalore. He had done his MBBS from Bangalore Medical College it is he is a based outgoing student from uh, his year it he is a winner of 12 gold medal and prizes he has done ms in, from pgi chandigarh he has done msc in neuro mch in neurosurgery from aims new delhi he is an international fellow of american association of neurosurgical neuro neurosurgical Sur, neurological surgeons he also done cns uh, Sajaita Fellow on Movement Disorder from Toronto Western Hospital, Canada. He is uh, also uh, a visiting fellow uh, uh, on University of Washington, Seattle for uh, skull base and cerebrovascular surgeries. His area of interest is cerebrovascular and skull base surgeries, movement disorders, craniovertebral junction and con congenital pediatric surgeries. Who he already present uh, published more than 140 uh, papers in various index journal, and he also rated various chapters and the various books. Currently, uh, he is an honorary sec secretary of Bangalore Neurological Society. He is an executive committee member Indian Society of Pediatric Neurosurgery. He is an honorary treasurer for Indian Society of Stereotactic and Functional Neurosurgery, and he is a founder member of Indian Neuromodulation Society. With this introduction, I would like to request this uh, webinar or hand over this webinar to Dr. Dwarkanath. Before handover, I would request all our participants to put their questions in chat box. So we can take this question at the end of the lecture. And now I will uh, hand over the session to Dr. Dwarkanath. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pregna, for the introduction. And uh, I would like to thank the Indian Society of Pediatric Neurosurgery uh, for, the, for organizing monthly webinars, which is, very info, which is very educative to lots of people. And I would like to welcome the president of uh, Indespian, uh, Professor Sandeep Chatterjee from Kolkata and also the Secretary of Indespian, uh, Dr. Deepak Gupta from Ames New Delhi. Uh, we also have a very distinguished panel of uh, uh, panelists today. Uh, I would like to introduce Professor Dio Pujari. He is the professor and head at Bombay Hospital, Mumbai. And uh, since uh, we are doing something on syndromic craniostenosis and the role of facio-maxillary sur surgery, I have, we have included two moderators 
who are basically facial max cranio facial maxillary surgeons uh, dr pramod subhash who is the head of craniofacial unit at amrita institute of medical sciences at cochin and dr girish rao who is a consultant uh, who is a consultant in facial maxillary surgery at in bangalore and is the visiting faculty at nimhans Uh, the selection of craniosynostosis was based. We we had a wonderful talk by Professor Steenbock around few months back on craniosynostosis, but that was more of a basic talk on uh, craniosynostosis and mainly focused on uh, the cranial repair. But over the past decades, uh, the, uh, the attention has been now focused on more minimally invasive distraction osteogenesis techniques, and also the some of the areas of Uh, and as many as many a neurosurgeon will uh, remember that the, when the kid comes back to you asks you for facial advancement we uh, then as a neurosurgeon we do not know much and we refer to our craniofacial team so i thought this was a good idea that we combine both the specialties and have a joint talk so that the craniofacial surgeons are aware of what we do in craniosynostosis is the cranial part and as cranial neuro as neurosurgeons we are aware aware of what happens in distraction if in for facial uh, mid face repair in craniosynostosis um, so i would like to in, uh, in, uh, welcome both the president and the secretary of indespn and the panelists for this today's talk regarding the speakers i have two wonderful speakers uh, professor ajay sinha himself an alumni of aims new delhi um, Uh, he he is a uh, he is a friend a good friend of ours and visits india frequently and we have had a wonderful conversation he is one of the leading authorities in craniosynostosis and it and is present a consultant pediatric neurosurgeon at the alder hay children's nhs foundation trust and the walton center nhs foundation trust and is also the training program director in neurosurgery in the northwest deanery he will be speaking upon syndromic craniosynostosis Uh, with special focus on the role of posterior wall distraction osteogenesis this will be followed by dr david richardson who is also uh, at the alder hay children's nhs foundation trust and he is a consultant maxillofacial surgeon there he will be speaking on uh, uh, fa facial advancement techniques and facial osteotomies uh, in uh, syndromic craniosynostosis uh with this i would like also like to welcome all the delegates and hope this is a good learning experience to all of us and uh, we are here to answer all any questions please free to put your questions in the chat box and uh, yeah, the we will definitely try answering most of all of them with this i would like to invite professor ajay sinha uh, and hand over the uh, mic to him so that he can start his presentation dr ajay Thank you so much, Dwarka, for your kind introduction. Can you hear me well? Yeah, we can. Yeah. Thank you so much. And once again, before I start, I would like to thank all of you. Nowadays, we tend to meet more in virtual world. It's been a long time since I've been to India to meet up with friends and catch up with the local gossip. And the topic of my talk today is going to be a. I'm only going to be concentrating mostly on posterior wall distraction, but that's one area which I is my area of interest. and we, along with it i'll try and cover some of the genetic aspects as well and you know neurosurgery is just small part of the whole process of craniofacial surgery so it, this work has been done along with a uh, whole host of other colleagues whom i'll introduce as we go along and to start with as is the norm there are no disclosures i haven't taken any funding for any source i was recently in india because my father sadly passed away and was in, because i was in home quarantine i had was spending time watching television and there was a lot of debate on nepotism which was quite interesting which i was never used to <laughs> seeing it in our times but that way and anyway and there's uh, there is no nepotism involved here though dwarka and myself both uh, from the same institute i think we did a surgical training in from pj as well so yeah. it's <laughs> so we were not contemporaries though <laughs> we are a few years uh, behind each other so you know there are no disclosures in the no nepotism please as you can see from this slide we are based in the northwest of england and we are one of the four super regional units and surprisingly the units are not geographically distributed the way it should be the 
three units down south, London, Oxford, and uh, Birmingham, basically within one, one and a half hours of train journey from each other. Whereas we are the ones who are a bit further removed. And we tend to cater to the whole of North of England, plus the Northern Ireland. So our, our catchment area is quite extensive. It's about 12 million, between 10 and 12 million is our catchment area for craniofacial surgery. So it's average, we end up operating about 200 plus cases a year. And for this sort of a volume, we need plenty of colleagues and, and specialists to support you. The core members of the team are the neurosurgeons, the maxillofacial and the plastic surgeons. They form the core surgical members of the team. But we also have a very good mix of geneticists, ENT surgeons, and respiratory physicians who have become more and more useful uh, and they've shown their value as, and I'll try and explain the role as in the, in the course of my talk, along with speech and language and ophthalmology and uh, clinical psychology, who also play a very important role in, in the management of these complex cases. Moving on. You know, when you talk of Liverpool, you talk of the Beatles. You cannot talk of Liverpool. In fact, I knew, never knew where, I could not put Beatles, uh, Liverpool on the world map, but I knew where Beatles were from. And not many people know that, you know, this Fab Four not only created and revolutionized the world of music, they also had a big role to play in the development of neurosciences. It, the, they were, the records were being sold by EMI. And it was EMI just funding all the research for the CT scans. So in, indirectly, they were, their success also led to the significant development in neurosciences. And with the CT scanner, if I have to check, talk of one big thing which changed the whole practice of neurosurgery or neurosciences, it was the advent of CT scanner. And it was this for the fellows who funded the research for CT scanners. Just a bit of historical vignettes to share with some of the participants who may not be aware of this part of the story. Syndromic craniosynostosis. Well, it's roughly about 10%, with more and more genetics being uh, advanced. The numbers are likely to creep up, as we're already noticing in our practice. Not only are the bond or uh, syndromic craniosynostosis having a genetic uh, input to it, but even the so-called non-syndromics, if you dig deep and if you do tests on them, you find that actually quite a few of them are turning out to have a genetic basis to it. So the actual figure of syndromic craniosynostosis is likely to go up, not in true sense of the term that not all of them will have mid-face hyperplasia, not all of them will have lib abnormalities, but the actual incidence of, hello, can you, of syndromic craniosynostosis is likely to creep up with development of new genetic techniques. Genetics, as you said, we were talking about is the single most important factor which determines how the children behave and also gives us a good idea of the prognosis uh, for these cases. And it allows us to you know, map out their, their progress because you, know, you have a sort of a, 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 a idea of how a, a FIFRS is going to behave or how a cruises is going to behave. So once you box them into the diagnostic uh, categories, it becomes much easier to give a long-term outcome and uh, surgical journey and medical journey for this patient. And that allows the parents to be better prepared to go through it. On an average, in our own experience, a, a syndromic craniosynostosis child <clears throat> goes through between 50 to 150 anesthesia during their lifetime. It may not be all to do with surgery. It may be just to do with scans or to, for minor examination and anesthesia. But the average anesthetic, general anesthetic requirement for a syndromic child before he or she finishes her surgical journey and goes into adulthood is about 150. So it's a lot of anesthesia and a lot of time and a lot of patience on the part of parents to take in. And genetics allows us to give them a broad framework through which to work through and also allows us to prepare ourselves for these cases. So you don't need genetics all the time. This young gentleman who is of British Pakistani origin brought his daughter to uh, the clinic and you don't need a geneticist to tell you that there is a familial link to it. But not all the cases have such a um, strong family resemblance. The vast majority of the children don't have 
uh, they're isolated cases, they're sporadic in onset, so don't have either of the two parents having any telltale signs of syndromic. But if you dig deep, and if you go through the history, you may find there is a, a grandfather who had some sort of a procedure done or had unusual uh, facial features. But majority of the cases are sporadic, they are not familial, and it's a de novo um, genetic mutation which leads to the development of syndromic craniosynostosis. And next slide appears to be very crowded, and I don't want anybody to spend too much of time reading through it, because what we are interested in is, as a surgeon is, what's the broad framework, what the child has got, because that it allows us to um, frame our treatment plan. And we also need to know if that gene is, is, is a sporadic one, or it runs in the family, and if it runs in the family, do the parents need to be told what are the chances of their other children getting, or if they have further children getting this particular condition, or if the child who grows up into adult, what are the risks of the child passing on the gene to his offsprings or her offsprings? That's one thing which you need to know. And the second thing which we need to know from the genetics team is if, it's, if they've told us that it is a TCF12 or a twist gene, does it have any bearing on the prognosis of this patient or the surgical management of these cases? And we know for sure, let's like say, for example, that the TCF12, this is a gene which was developed or you know, discovered and published only in the year 2013. So it's a very recent discovery and it was done by one of the uh, researchers from Oxford called Vikram Sharma. And Vic has shown in his uh, publication for 2013 that children carrying TCF12 tend to have a much higher um, chance of developing raised intracranial pressure and go on to develop multi-sutural craniosynostosis. They may start with a single suture, but they go on to develop multi-sutural craniosynostosis. That has a big bearing on how we follow up these cases and how we manage these cases. That's what I want to hear from a genetics. I'm not interested in if they tell us, well, it's got FGFR2 or FGFR3 involvement. It doesn't make any difference to me. That's going to be more of a, a you know, of academic pursuit. But the thing which I need to know is, is that gene going to have a bearing on my surgical management or is it going to have a long-term impact on the way the child develops or the way the child behaves? And we know for sure some like TCF12 or it's a twist chain with Sadie Shotson, they tend to have a much higher rate of reoperation and much higher rate of presentation with raised pressure. So over the next few slides, I'll go through what is our current way of dealing with managing and carrying out genetic investigations for the syndromics as well as for the isolated sutures, because some of the isolated sutures, as I was mentioning earlier, tend to also have a genetic link to it. So we start with a very simple one called metabolic synostosis, which all of us deal with it. And despite the fact that we may not find a genetic basis to it, uh, there is a small chance that you know, if children who have it will run a 2% risk or 2 to 3% risk of passing this condition on to their offsprings. And parents, if they have more children, they also run a small risk of getting a, another second child with metabolic synostosis. But more importantly, in the last few years, there have been this development and there's been discovery of a gene called SOMAD6. Now that gene is very important. If you find uh, your metabolic synostosis is, uh, has got SOMAD6 positivity, it has a big bearing. Not only do you need to look up into the child's cardiac history and do cardiac investigation, you also need to screen the family because most of these children who have SOMAD6 positivity also tend to have uh, associated bicuspid carotid uh, aortic, uh, aortic valve and also associated uh, aortic dilatation. And so this group of families will have to be screened for you know, potential life-threatening cardiac abnormalities. So this, this is something which has been and become a routine in our practice. But even for a non bog standard non-syndromic metabolic synostosis, even if they turn out to have you know, no clinical signs of, um, of uh, family history of, uh, of uh, uh, of synostosis, if they got unusual facial features, nowadays it's a common knob to run the common synostosis gene panel, which is R99, which you know, basically you're looking at FGFR123, twist, uh, TCF12, EFNB1 for front and nasal, as well as ERF genes. So you run these basic parameters to make sure that this is not a cruise which is evolving 
or not a fibers which is evolving, more likely to be crusons than a fibers which can present with a single suture synostosis, or not a TCF12 which is evolving in, in due course of time. So these are things which we or we have started doing somat six as a matter of routine for all our metabolic synostosis. <coughs> Going on to the next one, sagittal. Testing for sagittal for somat six has not become a routine, but it's just a matter of time. I think it's it's not being done at the moment, mostly because of cost constraints, once the testing becomes more prevalent, uh, I'm sure we will be doing, um, for all midline switches, we'll be testing them for somat 6. And once again, if you find a, a sagittal synostosis patient having facial features or in any slightest of, you know, the facial dysmorphism or any structure, any other positive family history, it's best to run the basic common synostosis gene panel to make sure that we are not missing or evolving cruisons or, uh, or a fibers or, or any other common syndromic conditions. For coronals, the risk is much higher. It's a 5% risk of a, a recurrence rate, and it's a rule to run the R99. And with the slightest of doubt, if there is any suggestion of you know, limb abnormalities or broad thumb or feet, we always run the common synostosis gene on them. And even if required, we run the more rare synostosis uh, panel on them called the R100 panel to make sure that we are not missing even some of the rare um, genetic or chromosomal anomalies which can be associated with uh, coronal synostosis. So for, to, just to give you a broad outline, for metopics, SOMAT6, for sagittals, it's still an evolving practice, but very likely SOMAT6 is going to be a, a common uh, testing uh, a gene which will be tested commonly, and it's just a matter of time. Up, uh, the guidelines will change, as has been told by Andrew Wilkie from Oxford. He, and for uh, coronal synostosis, whether it's syndromic or non-syndromic, we run all the full array. And it's the slightest doubt of having a syndromic background to it. We run not only the common synostosis gene pool, we also run the rare synostosis gene pool for coronal synostosis. Lambdoids are rare. So, you know, we normally don't test for lambdoids for any genetic and isolated ones are seldom associated with any genetic abnormalities. But what is important is some of the lambdoids also have all what is called a Mercedes-Benz type of synostosis. In other words, not only the two arms of the lambdoids which are fused, the synostosis tend to extend along the posterior aspect of the uh, sagittal synostosis. And we get the classic Mercedes-Benz type uh, synostosis. No, that those groups of patients who have uh, the synostosis extending along the sagittal suture, they are very commonly associated with the ERF gene. So if there is slightest of doubt, and if they have any, once again, if they have any family dysmorphism, or if the suture is the synostosis has a tendency to extend along the sagittal suture, it's very important to run the synostosis uh, yeah, gene profile. Yeah. I think somebody is shopping yeah. in the yeah. background. Can somebody turn the... <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> so moving on to the one which we will be commonly doing is the multi... When you talk of syndrome, you talk of multi-suture um, synostosis. The, uh, the common recognizable ones are the cruisons, the fibers. Uh, genetic testing is a must and it is done routinely. And we start with the common R99 panel. Most of the times you pick up mm, the deficit with R99 panel, or if, if the, the R99 is negative, by default, the lab will test them for the rare syndromic renosinosis gene and run the panel on our own, on their own, without even telling us. And the only problem with all the synostosis gene testing, it takes time. You don't get the results as we would like it to, in the next day or two or the next week or so. It takes weeks, sometimes even months. So you see the patient today and you kind of forget about, the, you send the genetic results and you will wait for several months before a piece of paper comes through. You know, nowadays you don't even get paper, you get a email sent through that patient X which you saw in September 2019, you get a result in March 2020. So it takes several months before the final results are true. They're getting efficient, but they're still not very efficient. Uh, this takes ages to run all the panel. I suspect it's to do with, um, with the array testing. They tend to pull in uh, samples before opening the, uh, 
in the the we have various reagents because it's quite expensive to test them as a single um, sample. So they tend, tend to pull in samples from the country and before running the test. All our, pretty much all our um, testing is centralized now in the country to Oxford. It's Dr. Andrew Wilkie, the Professor Wilkie's lab in Oxford, which runs all the tests. He is the big guru of craniosynostosis uh, genetic studies. Right, let's, let's come to the most mundane things, which is what we do, our bread and butter, the surgical management of these cases. And what are the main concerns? This is more for the newcomers or for the for new for the trainees. You know, there's a broad few things which we always take into account when we talk of a syndromic craniosynostosis. One, is there raised intracranial pressure, which is very likely to be the case. Is this, is there uh, and the raised intracranial pressure is caused by not just by one factor. There are several factors in play which decide whether how whether the pressures are normal or raised. The commonest cause is what is called cranial cerebral disproportion. In other words, the brain is growing in a small box and because there is a rapid head growth going on, brain growth growing on, the space for it is likely to be constrained sooner or later. So the commonest cause is cranial cerebral disproportion. This is super added by presence of venous hypertension because most of these children have anomalous venous drainage and they have very poor jugular uh, foramen uh, that is narrowed so they have the posterior part of the venous system, which normally becomes the predominant venous strain is out of the brain by the about six months of age. They fails to develop in these children and they tend to develop more uh, collateral circulations or collateral venous drainage around the foramen magnum to take care of the block in the foramen, block in the jugular foramen level. They have associated hydrocephalus and the hydrocephalus is the combination of tight posterior fossa and uh, plus venous hypertension. And they, not only do they have a tight first year fossa, they have uh, um, cerebral tonsil herniating as long as three to four centimeters into the cervical spinal cord area in the cervical spinal canal. And that adds to an element of central sleep apnea. And they also have an airway obstruction because they have very narrow keona. They have severe you know, the uh, aports could have associated cleft palate and they can ha they have anomalous trachea as well. The trachea is not well formed. The, the usual C of the trachea can be a W or uh, some variant of it. In other words, the trachea can be a bifid trachea. So all these elements add to the raised intracranial pressure, uh, pressure. And when you deal with this raised intracranial pressure, just dealing with one element of the whole jigsaw puzzle is not going to sort out the problem. You have to deal with the pay the you have to eliminate each and every of these various factors which lead to development of raised intracranial pressure. And the easiest one to do is to start with the airway obstruction. You know, make sure the airway is well, drilled, uh, well dealt with. And this is the first thing which we tend to do and get the ENT surgeons involved early on. So, because I'm going to move very quickly to posterior release and posterior distraction, I thought well, I'll just quickly go through what are the primary focus when this child gets admitted to our ward. The first thing is to make sure that the eyes are protected because the cornea exposure is one of the commonest problems in these children. So the eye doctors get involved very early on because they have to ensure that either with tarsography or with just conservative, you know, uh, 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 the taping of the eyes with regular eye care instilled early on, we train to protect the cornea. Then the ENT surgeons get involved, who will make sure that their child is breathing well. And, and that may involve starting with doing uh, serial coronal dilatation. In the past, all these children will have a tracheostomy straight away. Nowadays, the trick is not to give them a tracheostomy because that has a lot of bearing on the speech and language development and the, getting their fitting established. So we tend to avoid tracheostomy as much as we can, though it's not uh, uh, possible in all the cases. We try and avoid doing a tracheostomy. And the way we manage this is to get the ENT surgeons involved early on, who would take them down to theater, use standard ureteral bougies, in a, uh, the urethral bougies to dilate the nasal passages. And they tend to you, uh, you know, fashion out little nasopharyngeal airways, which the mother learns to change and teach the mom how to change it. And just to keep the kiona open and keep the air passes open. 
and that has impact on the child's breathing. It has impact on the child's feeding because if a child cannot breathe very well, it cannot feed well. And if it cannot feed well, then you cannot take him for any further surgery. So that's our immediate focus. We tend to get the respiratory team involved already on whether they need to do a baseline saturation study to make sure the child is safe at home before the child can be safely discharged with a, you know, a, a good feeding regime in place. It, if it is not oral feeding or tube feeding, it has to be a peg feeding. So peg may have to be done early on. Cornea may have to have tarsodaphy early on. Ophthalmologists get involved early on. And the EAT surgeons involved or get involved early on. And this is within the, with the first three to four weeks and the respiratory physician to make sure that the oxygen saturation is well maintained throughout. So the for initial involvement is more from the nursing side, from the, from the feeding side, and from the breathing and ophthalmology side, the neurosurgeon side in the background. We tend to move in slightly delayed. And our earliest involvement, in my opinion, and based on my little experience, that we seldom get called to deal with a, a problem in them before one month of age. The earliest I've been involved in managing these cases is about one, one and a half months when the, the cranial cerebral disproportion starts setting in. And that is the time when we need to find some way to mm, create space in the brain. And the traditional approach was always to do a, what is called a posterior release or basically it was a, a rehash of what we would do for say a head injury. You just take a piece of panel or bone out and my ex, my ex colleague who is since the gulf cranial facial surgery, Paul May, what he used to do was very simple. He used to take the bicondyl incision, take out a large chunk of parietal bones and leave them floating. That was his way of um, doing a posterior release. Uh, the Oxford team would normally take out all the bone as far back as they could go. They would take out the lambda suture. They used, even they do it now. They will take out part of the parietal bone and just put it in the bin. And you know, bone will reform in due course of time. And sometimes that may be the first thing which we need to do to buy time. There always been a tendency if we can, if we instead of just throwing bone away or just letting the bone lose, uh, which is no decompression, could you not move this segment of bone back? And that's something which uh, led to the genesis of uh, the concept of posterior distraction. And I'll come to it in a minute. So that's what we were, we were talking about. If you can move this segment of bone, we will be creating more space in the brain. And this early problem of um, cranial cerebral disproportion can be uh, reduced or minimized. And why do we need to do that? Well, sometimes, you know, change is forced upon us. Sometimes change is aspirational. The, the photograph at the top is the, how older he used to be when I started working there in 2001. It's a long time, it's almost 20 years now. And we have, in the last five years, moved into this brand new hospital. And, you know, it was, it was always aspirational to move into an ultra modern hospital with a, um, all singing, all dancing facilities, but some of the, the you know the traditionalists wanted to stay back in those old Victorian quarters. You know the change was forced upon us because the old system was fraying, fraying at the seams. The civil structure was not holding, and sometimes it was costing more to just maintain the building. And long term, we felt that it was much better to move into a new structure than you know keeps were putting money in into the old structure. So similarly with craniofacial, you know, some of the changes have been pushed upon us because, you know, the old system wasn't working to our satisfaction. If it was working, well, we wouldn't have thought of new ideas if, if it was that confident, it was, it was that um, efficient. So I'll just take you through the journey of a young girl who I have been following from 2004 onwards. This young girl who is still in a follow-up, in fact, I saw her two days back, was born in the year 2004. This is her photograph, and she was about a month old. And this is her MRI scan. For the first MRI scan, which was done, that was in 2004. As you can see, she's turicophallic. She's got, you know, very shallow posterior fossa. The, the cerebral tonsils are all the way down to C2. And there is a development. There is a corpus callosum mid arch, and there is early development of hydrocephalus. This is how she presented. As she saw planned, we, was, we were initially managing her on the board you know, with serial dilatation of the nose. And then it was, I think she ended up having a tracheostomy, but to no avail, she has uh, severe apneas, uh, you know, her uh, saturation would drop uh, several times on the ward. 
And Paul May, my colleague who was still working at that point in time, took the patient on one of his off days and said, I'll do something. And he went in and basically what he did was he looked, he made incision going from side to side. And you see this area where there is a depression, he's allowed this bone to bulge out. It's, uh, so it was a very conservative uh, little decompression done. And possibly that was the state of art at that point in time in 2004, nobody was doing anything different. So he managed to salvage the child and you know, with, with the help of ENT surgeons, and we managed to get on with it uh, for uh, another, um, another few, few months. And I think normally our practice is not to do a frontal orbital before uh, 10 months of age, uh, before 12 months of age. But this case, we are forced to do it much earlier because he was not settling down and you know, we wanted to do something. So he said, let's make the head bigger. So we did a very generous frontal orbital advancement. So he had the most stormy post, of course. He had bilateral subdural effusion, and then he drained the subdural effusion okay. with bilateral shunts. Can you hear me? Okay. And then we had the, uh, then we finally ended up putting in a shunt, and somehow we managed to salvage the situation. Four months later, she so presents, or three, four months later, she so presents this swelling in the eyes. And I don't know whether any of you have seen this complication. This is called orbital pseudomeningocele. When, because of frontal orbital advancement, there's a potential gap in the, between the frontal bar and the orbital roof, the brain tends to herniate through it. So this was a unique communication which had never seen before, happened to this child. And then we had to take her back to theater. And you can see there, uh, you know, there is this big change in the frontal, all the bone are herniated out. And there is a big, big gap in the roof of the orbit through which the brain is herniated out. So we had to re-explore it, repair the pseudomeningocele we managed to salvage the situation and we moved a decade later to 2014 when she was, she need, this was a scan then. And you can see that the brain is pretty much settled down. There's a shunt in place and this posterior fossa is still tight, but it's not too bad. And she was breathing okay. So we did a mid-face advancement and the, she tolerated the mid-face advancement very, very well. And there was no complications at all. And as is our norm, we always do a post uh, advancement sleep study. And this would be a very, very satisfactory sleep study. You can see there's hardly any obstructive sleep apnea. And I'm highlighting the central sleep apnea. I said, she's getting a few episodes of central sleep apnea, but they are very short length. And the apnea index, which is the number of apnea episodes per hour was 1.9. And if you look at the saturations here, at no point were the saturation dropping below 90, even when she was having these apneic episodes, she was getting, her saturations were pretty much holding above 90. But this was very satisfactory and we forgot about this patient. Five years later, the respiratory team, and this was about three months back, came to my office and said, I'm sorry, I have a patient of yours who is, I can't send the patient home. And as always is the norm, they come on a Friday afternoon when you're about to pick up your bag and go home. And said, we've just done a sleep study on this child uh, overnight and the response is horrible. You know, you can see the sleep apnea, which was about 10, had or 10 or 12, had gone up to 70, 71. And the apnea index from 1.9 has gone to 11.6. And see the number of times the saturation dropped below 90, 56%. He said, this patient is not fit to be discharged home. So, you know, everything changed. <laughs> we had to keep this patient on the ward, start investigating. This is what we did. We did the MRI scan. You can see that the chiari is still there. She had a sort of a, a conservative chiari decompression done as well, but it was to no avail. So we had to plan and do something on an emergency basis. And guess what we did? We ended up falling back on a step which we should have been doing early on. We ended up doing a posterior distraction. And I tell you, this is the oldest patient I've ever done a posterior distraction at the age of 15 or 16. It was no fun. It, took nearly the whole day just to get that much of bone off. And what I tend to do, just this is a bit of a technical um, information for people who might be doing this case with the shunt. I tend to cut an island of bone around the shunt reservoir and, and just cut it around and leave it floating. And that way, it, when in, we put the distractors on, this piece of bone doesn't need to move along with the distractor. Otherwise, the shunt tube will be pulled out. So we tend to leave an island of bone, cut an island of bone around the reservoir. So, She's done well so far. We hope it works. So she's still in the process of distraction. The distractors are likely to come out in due course of time.
But the important thing which has happened in the last few weeks after distraction, our saturations have remained stable throughout night. And we did an overnight Tosca study, which was absolutely normal. There has been no significant drop below 90. I think there was one episode. So there are two complications which I would like to highlight. One is sleep apnea, which I, this case quite highly, uh, with this highlights. Another is pseudomeningocele. In fact, we will look back to our own experience. We find that we have a small series of pseudomeningocele, which we published in the Journal of Craniofacial Surgery in 2015. And you find that in syndromic, the incidence of pseudomeningocele, orbital pseudomeningocele is very high, it's about 10%. Whereas in non-syndromic, we had just one case or you know, what two cases in the last few hundred we have done or few thousand we have done. And most important thing, none since we have introduced posterior distraction. That goes to show that the pseudomeningocele is a sign of race, uh, uncontrolled raised intracranial pressure and the pseudomeningocele basically a growing fracture skull. It is the brain herniating out through a defect in the bone and it's just, it's almost like a cranial cerebral erosion. That's what a pseudomeningocele is. How did the whole concept of uh, distraction start? Well, it started with this gentleman called Nick White and Hiroshi Nishikawa. Hiroshi, by the way, is Japanese, but he's from Birmingham. He is more a Brit than a Japanese. He speaks Japanese very well. It, it was their concept of you know, using the same principle what has been used in uh, mandibular distraction or, you know, going further back by the orthopedic surgeon for the limb lengthening and the Lazarus technique. So they use the similar principle and use it for posterior fall distraction. And this is when they published their report in 2008 of about six cases, I think if I'm not five or six cases, which they published in Journal of Child's Nervous System. And there were some elegant photographs in that. You can see this, you know, you can see that this distractors put in and there's a nice backward movement of the head, which was published in 2009, and you could see the change in the in the in the in posterior fossa. You see that the occipital overhang has been corrected, and the fourth ventricle, which is compressed, has opened up. And you know, you can see that the the corpus callosum, which was stretched and bored out, it's much more uh, you know, it's a much more symmetrical. So there was you know MRI changes which were noticed, and this was also manifest in the patient's improvement. And you know. Uh, this was a new thing which came out in manual syndromic cranial and everyone lapped it up. So what are the objectives? Why do we need to do it? One, and if you have to do it, why do you do an posterior? Why not anterior? <coughs> Our main idea is doing a posterior is gives you more volume for the amount of distraction you achieve with doing a posterior. And that has been proved in enough studies uh, so far. You know, the... Also, it, what it prevents is all these children get, tend to get a long, narrow head, almost like Bart Simpson, you know, of the Simpson cartoon. If one of you are interested in the Simpson, you remember Bart Simpson's head. It's typical Bart Simpson technique, um, skull shape they get. And that perhaps is prevented because of what happens with distraction, you tend to get more of a scaphocephalic uh, contour to the head and the turicephalic is controlled. We feel that the venous hypertension reduces, but that's open for debate. There hasn't been any objective study to prove that. And in our own practice, the need for hydrocephalus is definitely reduced, but not completely eliminated. And we have found that it does have impact on sleep apneas, both the central sleep apnea pattern, not the obstructive, but the central sleep apnea pattern. So these are the four objectives or five objectives, which we always keep in mind when we are doing this procedure. In terms of the amount of volume change, what this paper from, you know, this was a public platform presentation in the craniofacial surgery, uh, in the International Society meeting in 2015, they showed that they did a volumetric analysis where the Japanese are very good in doing these sort of studies because their number of patients are less. And they found that it causes 30% uh, increase in the skull volume, which is phenomenal. You know, we've noticed that in our own practice and I'll show you in some cases. In the future. So basically distraction has several phases. You've got a bone, you need to give bone time to start the acute inflammatory process, which is the latency process which is roughly about a week. Once the, uh, the inflammatory changes settle in and the fibroblasts move in, then you start the process of distraction, which is a millimeter a day for the next 20 to 30 days to get about two to three centimeter distraction. Then you allow the bone, new bone formation to consolidate roughly by about two months. And then you take the distractors out and the process of remodeling of the head goes on lifelong. But these are the four phase or five phases, which is important. 
The important phase is to keep in mind is the latency. Now we still follow the latency and stop distracting um, for a week, but the, the French group will start straight away. And they feel that craniosynostosis, sinusosis, the bone grows, whatever you do, bone is growing and bone because it's a, it's a growth disorder. So it doesn't matter, you don't need a latency phase. And sometimes because of raised pressure, we have had to start distracting on the table. So it can be done. Just to give you a few examples, this child presented to us with this sort of CT scan, and even the satchel, you can see that the posterior fossa is narrow, there's occipital overhang, there's no hydrocephalus. And this within, within four weeks, you can see that the, the, the scan uh, done about the MRI scan done about the same time, no hydrocephalus, not much of a change in no bowing of the, of the corpus callosum. Fourth ventricle is a bit tight, but with nothing raised as concern. And the posterior, the foramen magnum looks a bit crowded. Six weeks later, this is how the child develops. In you know, huge ventricles, you know, you can see that the brain, the cell tonsils have started herniating. And we had a huge debate in our department. The traditionalists wanted to put in a shunt, whereas the new guys wanted to do a distraction. And guess who won? Well, the traditionalists were told to go on annual leave. And we ended up doing a skull expansion. And it worked well, except for this case had a bit of a CSF leak. And I don't know, uh, any ideas what how would you manage it? Well, what I did was I did the ETV when the patient developed a CSF leak and it did a lumbar puncture. This particular case, I even opened up the foramen magnum so it was safe to do a lumbar puncture to just buy time. And we managed to save the child and uh, to take care of the hydrocephalus. Technique wise, when I started, I used to always use the AEM guidance to mark out the, um, uh, the uh, transverse sinus and the midline. Of late, I've stopped doing it because you know I can do it. <laughs> So I always used to mark it out and before I used to start and it takes five minutes to do it. And for beginners, I'll still insist, you're better off marking out the posterior fossa, know whether your transverse sinus is. It makes your surgery a lot more safe and efficient. And wide exposure, and you don't have to, sorry, you don't have to uh, cut the dura, the pericranium. You just have to cut a linear cut along the pericranium. And then basically the important thing is to make sure that Wherever you are going to put the distractor, the vectors are parallel. So to get the vectors parallel, we tend to spend a lot of time finding the exact site where the distractors are going to go in, look at the quality of bone on either side, and make sure that the distractors are put absolutely parallel so that when you move them back, they go in symmetrical rather than get a skewed um, movement of the skull. So that's where the distractors are put in. A little bit of technical note, when we put the screws, before putting the screws, we just put in a, a brain spatula and lift the bone and, uh, and uh, uh, push a big chunk of uh, gel foam below the, below the, between the dura and the bone. The idea of putting the gel foam is when you put the screws, sometimes the screws can catch the dura, but if there is a layer of gel foam, then the chances of catching the dura is minimized. In other words, if the dura is caught, then if you're distracting, the dura will get dragged along and you'll get almost like brain herniating out, you'll get a brain fungus. And because this is going to be communicating with the exterior, you're opening a Pandora's box of infection, CSF leak, and the rest. So we always put a bit of sponge stand on either side. And this has been something which we have developed and it's been done by most units now. And so it takes about two hours, so one and a half to two hours to do the whole procedure. We spend a lot of time padding the eyes because these children have very shallow orbits. So you spend ages padding the cheeks and the eyes so that they don't get retinal ischemia. The, if you, that's one thing which really slows down the surgery. And we have, we have over the years learned to develop uh, our own little padding techniques because it's very important to protect the eyes when you're doing this procedure. And the result you get, you get a decent movement. You can see this movement almost about two, two and a half centimeter, two centimeter movement going on. And you can see that already there are bone forming along the edges. And you get almost like a step here at the back, but over a period of time, the sharp edge kind of remolds and you get a very smooth contour to the back of the head. As cosmetic deformity at the back is never an issue. I've not seen in any of the patients complaining of cosmetic issue. And similarly, you can see that you can see the cut along where we have done just go along the, uh, just above the transverse torcula. In the good old days, I would, in this particular case, if, you, if somebody has been discerning, you'd notice that I even gone and done a foramen magnum decompression. I had to do the cuts and then from the top, go down and open up the foramen magnum if they had a huge cerebral herniation. Off late, I've stopped doing that because A, that's extra to the uh, risk of surgery. And secondly, 
it doesn't really help them a lot. In our own experience, we found that you know, if you do a good distraction, the tonsils tend to move up. Even if they don't move up, it doesn't cause any problem long term. So we stopped doing that foramen magnum decompression in the same setting. Problems, dural tear. Avoid it with the rest of the, you know, avoid it as much as you can. You know, we have tried ETVs, I've tried lumbar drains, and the idea is to avoid it. And if you get it, be prepared for the worst because meningitis and all these problems are going to be there. You know, the, 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 we have a protocol to see these children every week on the ward. The nurses make sure that the wound is well looked after. And that's the single most important thing which we have in, uh, put in our practice. These children need weekly visits and the ch parents have to be taught to do that properly because sometimes they get it wrong. They were not doing it the right way. Make sure that they're maintaining a chart, how many times they're doing it. They do it twice a day, 0.5 millimeter each. They're doing two turns a day or three turns a day if they're doing it properly and make sure that this is happening. And so we tend to see them weekly during the failure of distraction. And after that, you know, everything going fine. And we can wait for their distractors to come out in two, three months time. So it's important to have a good nursing support to do these cases. Problems, we know distractors broke, broke, break out, foot plates tend to thin through the skin. But generally with good wound care and good you know, weekly care, we tend to avoid all these complications. You know, not every case can be done. This child you know, was booked for a posterior distraction. And if you notice carefully, we, when we, this mother wanted a full head shave, sorry. That's, and we noticed such prominent venous channels on the head, we packed out. And we said, you know, we, we woke the child up and we found that she had the most horrendous venous channels, collaterals over the head. So we had to change the whole practice. We instead did anterior distraction. This was not one of the easy cases. And I would not wish it on anybody. This was hell because of a case. Every millimeter of the dura had to be, of the bone had to be cut with upcuts and we drill, you know, we could not use a craniotome. The dura was so badly stuck. Despite that, we had CSF leaks and dural tears and it required a lot of patience to manage this case. One of the rare complications which we describe is called gull winging. In other words, in the bone, because of the lambdoid suture being not flexible, the bone, instead of moving as a single piece, tends to buckle at the lambdoid sutures, so you get what you call a gull winging deformity. We have seen mild gull winging, and in some of these cases where there is, uh, we feel that the lambdoid suture is uh, a bit um, flexible, we tend to put uh, resorbable plates to stabilize the lambdoid suture. This is a slide which I borrowed from Hiroshi, who presented it in one of the meetings, and he very kindly lent me the slides. As you can see, the gull winging is quite prominent here. You can see these two areas are moved in where the central piece of bone has remained in place. What are the new developments? Well, I'm sure all of you would be aware that there's been a big move from just doing one-off ICP monitoring to doing what is called dynamic monitoring, mostly for hydrocephalus. And there are a number of devices in the market which are being used. Romantic has used this implantable device, uh, which is ceramic, which is being which gives you, you know, which allows you to do a ICP telemetry. And Metka, Codman, Metka, have, Bibron have come out with this borehole reservoirs. So when you have put a shunt, you have a borehole reservoir, and this allows you to also monitor ICP telemetry. So, you know, these are new developments which have come in, and this particular case, which, who was referred to us, it's a case of a delayed presentation, said the Chotson syndrome, gross popular edema, full failing vision. We knew he has raised pressure. So we decided instead of just, you know, do we, doing a standard posterior distraction, we inserted the implanted the ICP probe as well. And what was very interesting was when we put in the probe, on table, the pressure was 35. We distracted about a centimeter on the table because we were so worried of the pressure. And the pressure dropped to about 22, 23, or 25, I can't remember. We're still on the higher side of normal. I was on call for the weekend. So he said, we did it on a Thursday or Friday. We said, I'll see him on a Saturday or Sunday. If the pressure is still high, I'll start distracting early. Came on a Saturday, did the telemetry, and the pressure was down to 12. We said, we are not touching anything. We leave it alone if the pressure starts going up. On a Monday, despite no distraction, the pressure was still about eight or nine. So the pressures respond very well to vault expansion. And some of these cases, we have been monitoring them very, very closely. We find that the pressures is sometimes even drop down to zero and negative uh, as the distraction goes on. Of course, they build up, but you know, 
the posterior distraction has a similar and a phenomenal uh, impact on the raised intracranial pressure. And this has been proved by doing dynamic telemetric monitoring of ICPs in some of these cases. And you can see that falling distraction, there has an improvement. The sulcide gyrator pattern has improved in this case. This case is still waiting for the distractors to be taken out. So if I have to summarize, and I think I've exceeded my time, if I have to look at the, the whole management, and a child with cranial stenosis comes in, it's case admitted. We always bring to coordinate all the various services from an outpatient, it's impossible. They are admitted for investigation. So we do a baseline eye, ENT, speech and language, feeding assessment, respiratory assessment, baseline sleep or saturation study. It's more saturation than sleep in a little baby, in a neonate. Then we start with some basic radiological investigation, all of them have a CT and an MRI. And nowadays for airports, we do a full MRI brain and spine. It's much better to have the full cranial spinal access uh, uh, scan early on. If there is a problem of feeding, in if the tube feeding or oral feeding cannot be established, they have a peg put in. Tarsidafy may or may not be required. If serial taping of the eyes don't work out, tarsidafy is done and done early on to protect the eyes. The ENT surgeons at that point take over and start serial coronal dilatation and they put it in major pharyngeal airways, which works very well. Rarely still we end up requiring a tracheostomy. If once that's done, we tend to plan for a posterior dissection about six months of age. Occasionally because of mm, the, the children are, if they start decompensating and they start going off, at times, we are forced to do an early white calvarectomy, or in other words, just white sutureectomy. It, you know, it just nibble off all the race, all the few sutures, and leave the brain like a, leave the head like a bag of water, almost like you know floppy in your hand. And this, most of the time, that works. In a small percentage, at that point, they will require a shunt to be put in or ATV to be put in. For shunts, always use the programmable for this group of patients they are very prone to getting into trouble with uh, standard fixed pressure valves. So I, we tend to use a programmable for all these cases. And in a small percentage, you can use ETV, but these are few and far between. And our usual practice is to do a frontal orbital advance between 12 to 18 months of age. And mid-phase, that's a variable time course. Idea is to do it around the time of school changeover, but you know, Mr. Richardson is going to cover that. So if that's not my area of expertise, he will take you through it. So I'm not going to talk on that. And finally, you know, some of these cases, because not only do you get a movement of the back of the head, you also get a movement of the, of the front of the head. So if you have good eye closure in some of these cases because of, you know, uh, paradoxical movement of the front of the head because of distraction, there's a role for some of these cases not to even have a frontal orbital advancement, but just go for a monoblock up front. And I think the number of such cases and debates about doing a monoblock rather than a frontal orbital advancement are few, but we do have one or two cases in our follow-up where you know, we are potentially looking at doing a one-stage monoblock rather than a frontal orbital advancement, or the frontal orbital advancement has been avoided. The numbers are few. I can think of on the top of my head one or maybe two cases in our whole series of cases. And I'd like to stop at that point. Thank you once again for all of you who, for giving me an opportunity. And I'm happy to fire on and uh, take on any questions. I see Dave is already on. He's on, on the screen. So welcome, Dave. Uh, thank you. Sorry, I messed up. I thought it was half one. It's half. It's half. It's okay. Sorry. I'm here. <laughs> That's important thing. <laughs> okay. uh, I, I had the scare of uh, my life in the morning. <laughs> Just log in and realize that UK has changed. To, uh, you know, it was my mistake. I thought it was changing next weekend when I started the email conversation. It was my mistake. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, so a very nice talk, Dr. Rajay. I think we'll take the questions at the end. So where both of you can answer the various Okay, questions. that's fine. There are okay. some questions in the question and answer and chat box. Probably you could answer them. But I think we'll just go to the second talk and then we will have a joint. I think that would be a good idea. So I'm going to mute myself now. And you know, we'll go to Dr. Prof. Uh, Mr. Richardson talk. Okay. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you, Dr. Ajay. And uh, I just introduce uh, Mr. David Richardson. Uh, I would like to first welcome and thank you. Thank you for joining.
and uh, sharing uh, going to share your experience with all of us mm-hmm. uh, dr uh, mr david richardson is a senior consultant and maxillofacial surgeon at the alder hey children's hospital and liverpool university teaching hospital trust um he after reading dentistry and medicine in london and he completed his training course at kings east grinstead plymouth and liverpool was appointed as the consultant maxillofacial surgeon to the regional maxillofacial unit in liverpool in 1995 with specialization in pediatric and adult craniofacial surgery as well as orthognathic surgery and management of post traumatic deformity including skeletal and soft bone deficits he also has developed an interest in surgical ear reconstruction for congenital microtia and acquired traumatic ear amputations he has been part of the liverpool pediatric craniofacial team for over 25 years and has a wide experience in pediatric and adult craniofacial surgery so i would like to again welcome mr david richardson and would hand over the uh, screen to him so that he could start his uh, presentation <laughs> welcome mr okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I, I have less experience in screen sharing on Zoom meetings, so I guess I just go to the screen share, uh, and um, yeah, let's see if that works. Yeah, it's working. Yes. So yeah, so you, you can you all see that? Yeah, yeah, we can. Okay. Well, thank you very much for that uh, introduction and those kind words. Um, yeah, my name is David Richardson. I'm one of the consultants in Liverpool in the UK. Um, and as you heard, my background is in maxillofacial surgery, and I've been asked to talk about uh, facial management in craniosynostosis. Uh, and so I just want to start by considering those aspects of facial function and form that are affected in craniosynostosis. And as you're all aware, this includes eye protection, breathing, feeding, speaking, and appearance. Uh, of course, appearance uh, affects both the, the so-called simple non-syndromic, often uni Uh, suture synostoses, um, uh, as well as the complex syndromic cases that AJ has just been talking about. And again, in his last slide, AJ alluded to those uh, other functional facial concerns of uh, eye protection, breathing, feeding and speaking, uh, which predominantly affect only the syndromic patients largely. And I just wanted to start by talking about appearance and, and how uh, I assess that clinically. And, and it's, this is very simple. Uh, uh, we have to assess the face in three dimensions and looking in any one direction, you can only assess two dimensions of space. So if we look in the full uh, face view here, we can assess the, the vertical and transverse dimensions. So what about the vertical dimensions? Well, if we draw a line across the eyebrows and just below the nose through subnasale, we can divide the face into three uh, thirds of equal height, the upper third, the mid third, Uh, and the lower third. And that's a very useful concept in management of the face in craniosynostosis. If we're looking at transverse development, we can drop vertical lines down through the median lateral canthi on either side and divide the face into vertical fifths. And the width of each of those fifths should be equal. Uh, of course, you'll see here that the intercanthal distance is noted at 35. That's too much, 32. So you can then multiply 32 to get 96 for an interlateral canthal distance and so on. Uh, and that's a very, uh, th these are very simple and quick ways of assessing where facial deformity lies. Uh, if we look in a bit more detail at the, uh, uh, the central fifth of the face, uh, the intercanthal area uh, is particularly important in craniofacial patients. And you can further subdivide that into equal thirds as shown here. And the main message here is that the bridge of the nose should only occupy the central third of that medial uh, column of the face. Uh, uh, and, and if you can achieve that, you'll get a good aesthetic result. Uh, we have to look at the patient in profile to, to assess anteroposterior relationships. Uh, and I like this orbital balance grid. The baseline is a vertical line dropped uh, tangent to the anterior surface of the globe of the eye here. Uh, and you can see that this, we're aiming for a supraorbital ridge about 12 millimeters in front, nasal bridge about five to eight millimeters. The infraorbital uh, area, so, uh, area should be roughly on that line. And if you then project that line down, uh, it bisects the, the sort of curve, the convexity of the cheek uh, at around the uh, level of the alum of the nose. 
so those three very simple, very easy, very uh, uh, rapid assessments are virtually all you need in order to assess the facial deformity uh, in craniosynostosis patients. So let's think about the upper third. Uh, well, of course, the upper third is affected um, by the crania cranial component of the deformity. And of course, in the non-syndromic population, we see trigonocephaly, uh, brachycephaly, uh, and, of course, and, uh, and of course, plagiocephaly. And uh, plagiocephaly, as you all know, affects not only the upper third of the face, uh, but the lower two thirds, because there's this facial scoliosis with progressive deviation away from the affected side as you move down uh, from the mid third to the lower third of the face. Uh, I'm not going to talk about frontal orbital advancement because I know that's been covered, but I just did want to highlight a few uh, technical points that I think are important in achieving a good aesthetic outcome uh, when we're doing surgery for the upper third of the face. So the first thing to say is that the incision uh, we make is a very posterior incision. In fact, this is a slightly old slide and, and, and we would put the incision more in this area now. And we do that for three reasons. One is because it's nearer the back, so it's cosmetically better. Uh, but the two major uh, issues um, are that if we have a posteriorly placed incision, that's placed over an area of non-operated vascularized bone and pericranium. So if we get a little bit of wound breakdown, uh, it simply remains a local problem and that wound breakdown isn't located over defects in the pericranium and the, and the, and the bone uh, communicating with dead space and non-vascularized bone flaps. And as you will see later, we do big advancements, so there is a degree of tension on the wound. Uh, so the, uh, and the third reason is because the further the incision is away from the brow, we've got a much bigger distance of skin to utilize its inherent elasticity and creep characteristics to reduce tension on the wounds. Um, so we do a very posterior wound. In terms of uh, how much bony remodeling we do, we uh, take the craniotomy flaps right to where the deformity starts. And again, in this trigo case, uh, I think we're a little bit further forward than we might otherwise be almost on the coronal suture. So usually we're going two or three centimeters behind the coronal suture. So this is really almost an anterior two thirds remodeling rather than a very localized frontal orbital remodeling. Of course, the remodeling uh, is uh, done uh, using templates as uh, guidance. We find that very helpful. The frontal orbital bar is the easy bit because that's two dimensional. Uh, and it's a forehead which is very much three-dimensional uh, that is the uh, technical challenge in reproducing that three-dimensional form of the forehead. Of course it doesn't matter how you do it, you just need to get the right shape uh, at the end of that process. Uh, I prefer to use uh, a split level bicoronal flap, in other words uh, raising it in the subgaleal plane, uh, uh, and uh, it's important to replace the pericranium at the end uh, to cover that construct because the pericranium is the osteogenic potential for future appositional bone growth. Uh, and we know from our experience in the past where we've left gaps uh, in the pericranium covering the bone, uh, there may be a lack of that uh, appositional bone growth potential and the gradual emergence of contour defects that then may require subsequent treatment. We mobilize the temporalis partly to reduce the temporal hollowing that you can get uh, with frontal orbital advancement, partly to again transfer that, that uh, um, uh, vascularized uh, pericranium to cover our construct and of course we want to make sure it's well suspended so that the temporalis doesn't slip and cause bulging in the temporal region later on which is actually quite difficult to correct. Uh, we do big advancements, in fact we overcorrect. Um, we're not uh, unique in that but you can see here that if we put that baseline that I talked about earlier, the line tangent to the front of the eye, um, the brow is, is significantly behind here. And of course, at the end of the procedure, uh, it's well in front. Uh, and so you can see why we need to put the incision at the back to uh, reduce tension and make sure it's over good, uh, healthy vascular tissue. Uh, why do we overcorrect? Uh, well, I was impressed when I started uh, in craniofacial surgery that uh, patients who had um, a frontal orbital advancement that looked very nice at the end of the operation, um, uh, didn't look so good at the age of five, six, seven and eight years because of uh, a failure of growth or a, or a, or a reduction in growth. Uh, and we did a small study that showed that we get about a, 
five to seven millimeter relapse. This is in the first six months uh, mm -hmm. in the AP dimension. Uh, so we overcorrect uh, significantly, and that does put a lot of tension on the wound. Uh, but we feel that gives a better long-term outcome. In terms of appearance, uh, this is just a, a, a moderate trigonocephaly patient, and that overcorrection you can see is quite marked. We don't always do it quite to this extent. But if we're overcorrecting, the limit uh, of that uh, is that the brows have to be over the bone. You can't move the forehead forward and have the brows hidden underneath uh, the bone. So it depends on that soft tissue elasticity. Uh, you have to warn parents about this because, of course, they'd be very alarmed if they saw this um, without being pre-warned. Uh, and once again, you can see even with a big advancement of the lateral canthus here, we're talking about two, two and a half centimetres, sometimes a little more. You can get very nice uh, wound closure if you adhere to those uh, surgical principles. And this is him about six months later. So you can see there's been a significant improvement to settling. Uh, the brow is now uh, in a good relationship to the lobe of the eye. Uh, and um, we feel that in most cases, that's uh, uh, the, the outcomes are generally very good. So this is a, just a trigonocephaly case treated in the same way. Um, a brachycephaly uh, case, again, good, good brow to eye relationship. Uh, and uh, once again, in plagiocephaly, we want to overcorrect. I think it's almost impossible to overcorrect these patients. Uh, and you can see that there's been a softening of the facial scoliosis uh, pre and post uh, frontal orbital advancement. But one of our doctorate students has done a study looking at facial um, twisting. Uh, and um, uh, that shows that once you've done the frontal orbital advancement, you don't really, you can't really expect the face to untwist further. So it's important to try to overcorrect this as much as possible, both in the AP plane and the vertical plane, uh, to bring the brows uh, into, a, into a better relationship with the face to hide that facial scoliosis. And once again, you can see a good relationship of the brow to the eye here. Of course, uh, we can't always rely on future growth. Uh, and sometimes you get a, a, a very significant failure of growth. And this is just a couple of examples uh, to show you how we can deal with those. Uh, this young man has had a repeat frontal orbital advancement. Uh, and once again, in terms of the face, uh, in the pre-op profile here, uh, it looks as though the face is very prognathic. Uh, it's very protrusive. Um, uh, but if you put our baseline in there, uh, you can see that the brows and the forehead are set back. And of course, if you look at the baseline here, there's a, a much more normal relationship. So repeat frontal orbital advancement is a possibility. I, I wonder if, I if somebody can mute them there if they're having conversations uh, away from the meeting, please. Uh, yeah, this uh, request, please can you mute uh, okay. Okay, uh, Anyway, so this is a transverse defect of the, of the upper third of the face. Uh, and of course, this is complex. Uh, Pradna, can you unmute all dimension the planning is very helpful here. Uh, in an, and... and uh, so we tend to get a stereo, stereo lithographic model uh, made. This can be re reproduced in hard wax and we can then simulate surgery. We can experiment with diff different osteotomy patterns uh, to try to get the optimum result. Of course, this is a process that has to be done in conjunction with the neurosurgeon because we don't want to take a plan to the operating theater that is either simply impossible or dangerous from the neurosurgical point of view. So this is very much a joint uh, venture, but you can see that that planning restores uh, the aesthetics of the upper part of the face. Uh, and uh, again, the, in, in terms of reoperating, uh, the asymmetric deformities, plagio, anterior plagiocephaly, is the one associated with the most subsequent growth problems. And again, this is just an adult with a slip temporalis, some uh, uh, recession here, and a persistent um, recession of the brow. And this is just treated. Uh, using a uh, custom-made implant, uh, which uh, usually works very well to correct those uh, deformities, of course, without um, uh, operating uh, on the bone itself. So what about the mid-third of the face? Well, it's the mid-third that's affected in the so-called syndromic craniosynostosis, and you're all familiar with those. So uh, we have that mid-face hypoplasia, and um, uh, this is just a list of some of the commoner uh, 
um, syndromes, of course, uh, the uh, many that I haven't mentioned there. So in syndromic craniosynostosis, we have to think about the cranium, the orbit, and the mid face. Uh, of course, the cranium in principle is uh, handled in the same way as in the non-syndromic cases. Um, uh, but in terms of facial uh, development and problems, again, we have to think about all those functional parameters. So what problems do we have with the orbit? Well, AJ alluded to this earlier. <clears throat> Uh, you have restricted growth of the forehead and the mid-face in the anteroposterior direction or the anterior direction, re resulting in a shallow orbit and proptosis. Of course, most syndromic craniosynostosis patients have bicoronal uh, synostosis. And of course, in that instance, the temporal lobe bulges into the lateral orbital wall as a compensatory growth mechanism. And that pushes uh, uh, an eye out of an already shallow orbit further. So sometimes proptosis can be very severe. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, and we tend to see proptosis in fifers on the left and crews on, on the right. Uh, these are the more severely affected patients. And on occasions, and this is very rare, you can see a patient where there is effectively almost no eye socket and the whole of the eye uh, is out with its um, uh, bony uh, cavity. And of course, in this situation, uh, and, in, and in less severe situations, uh, eye closure, uh, corneal health and eye protection are significant issues. And of course, we want to uh, avoid ocular prolapse with the lids closing behind the eye, because of course, that's gonna be a, a very rapidly sight threatening emergency. So how do we manage that? Again, AJ mentioned conservative measures, eye drops, uh, eye creams, uh, taping uh, are, often are adequate. If they're not, uh, we can do some minor surgery with tarsography, and of course our, our ophthalmic surgeons are a very important part of the team. Uh, for very severely affected patients, we may be forced into an early frontal orbital advancement, uh, which of course is going to bring the uh, orbital, the, the upper orbital rim forward and the upper eyelid, uh, or monoblock, uh, which will bring the whole of the orbital rim forward uh, and bring the lids forward so that they're closing in front of the eye. But fortunately, those cases are very rare. Um, what about APERT syndrome? Well, proptosis is less um, significant in APERTs, but you can see this uh, increase into orbital distance, the hypertelorism, that, that outward rotation of the orbits and the lateral cancel dystopia characteristic of uh, APERTs. And of course, it's important to bear in mind that, there are, that there's a high incidence of ocular abnormalities, squints, astigmatism and refractory errors. And so, again, it's important that the ophthalmologists are uh, uh, um, uh, uh, core members of the team because we don't want patients to develop um, amblyopia and visual loss um, with undiagnosed uh, ocular problems. And of course, that goes for the non-syndromic patients, too. And you can see the Unicoronal patient here has a, a divergent squint affecting the right eye, um, as does this bicoronal uh, bilateral divergent squints, and of course trigonocephaly too. So uh, that's very important. Maintaining vision, of course, is a very important function. Uh, what about the mid-face itself? Well, the most important function of the mid-face uh, is to facilitate breathing. Uh, and of course, we know that these patients may uh, be prone to airway obstruction for a number of reasons, coenal atresia or stenosis. Of course, there's a small posterior nasal space because the, uh, the maxilla, the midface, is set back relative to the skull base. And even normal size adenoids and tonsils uh, in that constricted, already constricted space can cause significant obstruction and may need attention. Of course, there, there may be abnormalities uh, lower down in the upper respiratory tract, uh, and as always, we have to be aware of those neurological, neurosurgical causes of central sleep apnea. Uh, so airway obstruction, of course, will result in apnea and carbon dioxide retention, which, of course, is going to exacerbate all those conditions that AJ was talking about and that you're all familiar with. Uh, and there's this complex interrelationship, isn't there, between obstructive apnea and central apnea. The one can exacerbate the other, and that can work in both directions if we think about pharyngeal tone, for instance. So the respiratory physicians are, uh, again, core members of our team uh, who uh, are needed to investigate uh, and manage these patients. So what um, are the 
maneuvers we have available to treat airway obstruction where we can bypass the obstruction we can relieve the obstruction or we can overcome the obstruction uh, again uh, aj mentioned uh, nasopharyngeal airway which is which is our preferred um, way of coping with the upper airway obstruction in neonates uh, and in many cases can avoid the need for tracheostomy of course tracheostomy is a very reliable way of bypassing uh, upper airway obstruction but uh, has its own uh, problems and difficulties, so best avoided where possible. But of course, that isn't always the case. In terms of relieving up the obstruction, again, AJ uh, mentioned briefly coanal dilation. Of course, in slightly older children, we can uh, remove adenoids and tonsils. Uh, and if we uh, can, uh, and if following assessment and treatment uh, of those um obstruction still remains at that level we have the option of mid-face advancement to open up the post-nasal space uh, and we can try and overcome obstruction with non-invasive ventilation CPAP and its variants and of course the respiratory physicians are the people who supervise and monitor that aspect of treatment uh, and again always bearing in mind uh, the possibility of central uh, causes of course, feeding is a significant issue for a number of uh, reasons, uh, developmental abnormalities, structural abnormalities, um, uh, uh, sometimes associated cardiac abnormalities and so on. So our speech and language therapists, again, uh, important members of the team who can provide advice. Of course, a nasogastric tube may be required. Uh, and if this is going to be a long term issue, then, of course, gastrostomy uh, feeding uh, is the method of choice. And we have to bear in mind that some patients, about maybe 30% of APERTs, for instance, will have a cleft of the palate with the associated feeding problems that that can uh, cause, uh, along with the velopharyngeal incompetence and problems with middle ear aeration and hearing. So we have to have close liaison with the cleft team as well. Uh, what about the dentofacial uh, deformity? What do I mean by that? Well, there's a mid-face retrusion. Uh, which involves a three-dimensional hypoplasia affecting the nose orbit, zygoma and maxilla. So often all three planes of space, vertical, transverse and anteroposterior. And uh, this is a, a Cruzon patient uh, and you can see that retrusive appearance of the uh, mid-face. And when we're looking at these profile views, it's usually uh, the eye and the mandible that are in the right place and everything else uh, is set back. Uh, that has an effect on the relationship of the jaws because, of course, the maxilla and the maxillary dentition uh, are attached to the mid-face. Uh, so you can see there's a, a significant AP deficit and often a vertical deficit in uh, biting the teeth together and an associated malocclusion. And, of course, sometimes this can be quite severe. So this is an a, a fairly typical APERTS patient. Uh, there's narrow, high arched palate. There's very severe dental crowding here. Uh, and of course that can compromise dental health because of course you can't keep the teeth clean uh, and so on and so they have high levels of decay uh, uh, and you can see the abnormality of occlusion this so-called anterior open bite where the back teeth meet and the upper teeth uh, are still apart uh, and this class three uh, incisor relationship uh, with the lower jaw and lower teeth well ahead of the upper jaw uh, and the upper teeth uh, so again the uh, the paediatric dentist and the orthodontist, or orthodontist are key members uh, of the team and required to intervene to get the best results. But what we can, can we do as surgeons to ameliorate some of these problems? Well, we have mid-face advancement, and there are basically three indications for that. Uh, eye protection, we've talked about, and of course, if, uh, if there's difficulty in, in eye closure, that mandates early intervention. Uh, similarly, if uh, management of the airway uh, is severe in the neonate, then of course it's dealt with, with uh, nasopharyngeal airway and tracheostomy. Uh, but we will consider early mid-face advancement for less severely affected children who may not be coping with non-invasive ventilation. So maybe from the age of five or six, we will consider early mid-face advancement for, uh, for airway indications. Uh, but in those patients uh, who don't have eye protection problems or airway problems uh, and uh, require the surgery for psychological reasons, the change of appearance, we usually that, do that at 10 years of age. And that's because we can get that element of their surgical management done before the change from primary to secondary education. Uh, 
Uh, and there were very few psychological problems before that stage because children are brought up with uh, the same group of peers they've known forever. Uh, but when they go from uh, primary to secondary school to that hostile, much bigger environment, then their psychological problems can emerge. Uh, so we like to do the mid-phase advancement for appearance change at about that time. And of course, our psychologists, once again, key members of the team, very helpful in uh, assessing, taking patients through these treatments and um, uh, helping them to cope with their uh, difference in appearance, both before and uh, after surgery. So we have three ways of advancing the mid-phase in essence, the 4 3 osteotomy, facial bipartition, uh, and monoblock. Uh, again, AJ alluded to that briefly. So what about the 4 3 osteotomy? Uh, well, as you all know, this effectively disarticulates the whole of the mid-phase from the uh, skull base. So that's the nose, the zygomas, uh, and the maxilla in orbital margin and so on. And this is just a schematic diagram uh, of the level of cut of the bone cuts. Uh, so let's look at this patient with cruise on in, again in a bit more detail. And, and I haven't put this in because it's an ideal patient, but, but it's, it's a patient who illustrates both the advantages and benefits of the 4 3 osteotomy as well as some of its limitations. Um, so uh, if we look at the intercanthal distance, it's okay. Uh, the intercanthal distance may be marginally wider than the, uh, this, the width of the palpable fissures. If we look at the nasal bridge, that's quite narrow. Uh, we, we, we don't have that one third, one third, one third ratio. In many cruise on patients, you do. Most cruise on patients, that isn't uh, an issue. Uh, but you'll see why I've put this in later. Uh, there's a degree of lateral cancel dystopia, isn't there? And uh, again, sometimes we see that in cruise on, sometimes we don't. If we look at the uh, AP assessment uh, and put in our baseline, we can see that the, the brows are not too bad, but the nasion uh, and the mid face are set well behind where they should be relative to that line. So there's nasal bridge, infra uh, orbital, and malar retrusion. There's a short mid face. Uh, you recall that the vertical thirds of the face should be equal in height, and you can see clearly that the mid third of the face is significantly shorter than the lower third of the face. So that tells us what we need to do with our Lefort 3 osteotomy. We need to bring it forward to correct the AP deficit, and we need to bring it down to correct the vertical deficit. Uh, and we do that using distraction osteogenesis. I think most uh, people do. So um, uh, and uh, AJ briefly talked through the process uh, related to posterior skull distraction. It's exactly the same in principle. So we do the Lefort 3 osteotomy, and you can see the pre op uh, lateral KEF X ray here. Uh, this is during the distraction process. So we've done the Lefort 3 osteotomy, we've attached it to this distraction frame. We prefer to use the KLS Martin rigid external distractor. Uh, and we can discuss the reasons for that uh, uh, if you like. But uh, we bring this, the face forward at about a millimetre a day. And you can see that uh, we, uh, uh, there's a significant change. So if we look at the level of the occlusion, for instance, the upper incisor tooth there has been brought uh, in front of the lower incisors to, to that normal relationship. Uh, and I just want to point out at this point that the, the reason for doing a mid-face advancement is not to correct the occlusal relationship. Um, because uh, in some cases, if you attempt to fully correct the occlusion and bring the upper teeth in front of the lower teeth, you will overcorrect the upper part of the midface. So the aim of the midface advancement is to correct the, the uh, periorbital, infraorbital, uh, zygomatic, and nasal anatomy. Of course, you get an improvement at the dental level. Uh, but we don't worry if we leave them uh, in a slight class three, in other words, upper incisors below lower incisors position uh, for two reasons. Um, uh, uh, of course, we don't want to overcorrect. And even if we get a, a correction at this point uh, in the dental relationships, we know that the mid-face isn't going to grow. That's why we're doing the operation, because it hasn't grown. And of course, doing an operation isn't going to make it grow. So we want to try and put it in its adult position um, but we know that the lower jaw is effectively normal and will continue to grow. Uh, and so we will lose uh, that, uh, that relationship. And one of our fellows did a study of the overbite and overjet, that's the vertical uh, overlap and the anteroposterior relationship of the teeth. And in essence, with these procedures, 
the vertical change is stable and maintained. So if you have an anterior open bite, a gap between the upper and lower front teeth, uh, and you bring the, um, the mid face downwards, you'll close that gap and that closure will be maintained with further growth of the, of the mandible. But what you lose is the AP relationship because uh, you don't get any further AP growth uh, or anterior growth uh, and the lower jaw will grow ahead of the upper jaw again. So part of our sort of protocol for treatment is to factor that in. And that's something that can be dealt with much more simply at the age of 15, 16, 17 years. So here are the AP changes, uh, and you can see there's now a much more normal relationship of the mid face to our, our uh, baseline uh, for the AP assessment. Uh, and similarly, you can see now that the mid height, uh, the, the, the height of the mid face is the same as the height of the lower face. And uh, effectively, you can see that there's been a huge lengthening, increase in vertical height, um, nasal height and nasal length. Um, uh, with the alum of the nose brought from the inf inferior orbital rim right down into a much more normal position. And this is the only way you can get significant lengthening of the nose. A rhinoplasty surgeon cannot do this. You can only do it by a craniofacial osteotomy with the elongation at the nasion uh, rather than trying to do it elsewhere. But there is a price to pay uh, with these bigger osteotomies that are effectively moving different parts of the face uh, in the same direction because we're moving both zygomas, the nose and the upper jaw. Uh, and so we get an ideal result if all those, all those features need to move in the same direction and to the same extent. And actually that's very uncommon. So there is a compromise in the outcome of these cases. And you can see here that, that we've got a very nice profile, uh, but there's a, a degree of anophthalmus uh, because we've the vertical elongation uh, brings the uh, infraorbital margin and the orbital floor down, uh, expands the orbital volume, the eye sinks back a bit, and you can see this deep supratarsal fold, maybe a bit of pseudotosis, which are markers of uh, an ophthalmus, of course. So there is a compromise um, uh, with, with these bigger osteotomies. So you might say, well, why don't we split the face up and move the bits in the direction they want to? So effectively, we want to move the zygomas and the orbital margin straight forward. Uh, and we want to move the nose and the uh, upper jaw forward and downwards. Uh, so we could do this um, uh, uh, sort of segmented Le 4-3, uh, Le 4-2 malar osteotomies. Uh, and, and move those uh, various elements of the mid-face differentially. The difficulty is that we need to do distraction because usually the movements are very big. And if you try and distract segments like this, you can't control them. So this is really a non-starter. Um, uh, and we have to accept that we need to move the mid-face as a rigid single block, and we have to accept that compromise. Uh, the intercancel distance is the other uh, thing I wanted to mention here. And you can see in the full frontal view that the um, central um, uh, uh, fifth of the face uh, between the eyes is not normal because we've lost that one third, one third, one third uh, ratio. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, and the reason for that is that it relates to this, the, the anatomy here uh, that we looked at earlier. Uh, there's very little nasal projection here. So at this point, uh, the, the contour between the eyes is almost flat. Of course, the bone cuts we're making go behind the nasolacrimal apparatus. So we're bringing a little bit of the medial orbital wall, medial orbital rim, the nasolacrimal duct, um, uh, and the, uh, the leg, leg, nasolacrimal sac and duct forward uh, with the medial canthus. So we can bring it forward and project it. But if you don't have any prior nasal definition and projection, you just bring that whole width forward and that compromises the, uh, the outcome. Of course, you can get around this by doing further surgery later on to uh, recontour this area. Uh, but maybe on this patient, we would have been better doing a bipartition rather than a straightforward Le 4-3 uh, advancement, uh, because of course, facial bipartition uh, addresses those issues and is the technique of choice for APERS. And, and that cruise on patient had features that were slightly suggestive of APERS. Of course, as I said before, most cruise on patients do very well with a mid face advancement if they have a more normal pre existing uh, anatomy of the nasal bridge in the intercanthal area. So, um, uh, uh, 
bipartition is the technique of choice for APERS because this addresses the hypertelism and the orbital rotation. Uh, and it also addresses at the same time the narrow maxilla here. And you can see this slightly V shaped anterior open bite. So basically, the bipartition is a Lefort three osteotomy with the central segment removed and the two halves of the face separated like this. So that allows medial rotation of the upper part of the face, obviously correcting the interorbital distance, correcting that external rotation of the orbits. Uh, but at the same time, it expands the, um, the maxillary dental arch uh, lower down uh, and can uh, go some way to correcting this V-shaped uh, anterior open bite configuration that you can see illustrated in this schematic diagram. If we're going to do that, we need to, the orthodontist to move the roots of the teeth out of the way because in taking the V-shaped wedge of bone out here, we don't want to damage the dentition. Uh, it's very simple. It takes about six months. Uh, and so here you can see uh, the patient. Uh, there's clearly an increase into orbital distance. Um, the uh, bridge of the nose is less than one third of that, as we saw in the last patient. Again, we've got that lateral canthal dystopia with the uh, external rotation of the orbits. Uh, and you can see the AP deficit and once again, the vertical deficit, which is similar to the cruise on patient that we saw. Uh, and here's she is before and after. And again, if you just reapply those lines, you can see the significant improvements uh, in most of those parameters. Of course, you can't get complete corrections uh, with these procedures. Uh, uh, the 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 medial movement of the orbits uh, is something that, of course, is done on the operating table. We just uh, move it um, and wire it or fix it with plates. And then having done that, we can then apply the distractor uh, and distract in exactly the same way as we do for the cruise on patient with the Lefort uh, 3 osteotomy. Uh, and uh, once again, uh, if we just put our baselines for assessment, you can see that we've increased the projection uh, of the uh, mid-face, the nose, the zygomas, the inforbital area, the maxilla, uh, and we've normalized the vertical height of the face in doing this. What about frontofacial monoblock? Uh, well, this is, a again, a schematic diagram showing it done uh, with uh, internal fixation, but, uh, but of course it's a combination, if you like, of a frontal orbital advancement uh, and a Lefort three osteotomy as a single block. Um, uh, it's only indicated uh, in very rare and severely affected infants, uh, youngsters who have a combination of raised intracranial pressure, difficulties with eye protection, uh, and difficulties with airway obstruction, because of course it addresses all those issues by making the cranial compartment bigger, uh, by making the orbits deeper, by bringing the rims forward, and of course bringing the mid-face forward opens up the post-nasal space. Um, so uh, so uh, these are rare cases uh, in our unit, uh, but this is uh, uh, one patient from a few years ago. And once again, you can see that the eyes and the mandible are in the right place. Everything else is set back. So she's had a frontofacial monoblock. Again, we use the, the uh, rigid external distraction system that you can see there to bring that forward. And again, you can see uh, the significant uh, structural morphological differences between here and here clearly with uh, increase, uh, big increase in intracranial volume, uh, big increase in orbital volume, and hopefully a big increase in the post-nasal space to allow decannulation. Uh, monoblock is also indicated uh, simply for appearance change in a very limited number of patients. And this goes back to what I was saying about the Lefort 3, that with any osteotomy like this to get a good result, um, whatever you're moving in that block has to want to move in the same direction and to the same extent. So this is a previously unoperated cruise on patient. You can have a look at her. There's no um, uh, problem with the intercanthal distance, those vertical fifths of the face. The nose is occupying the central third of that intercanthal area. So that's good too. And of course, there's no uh, rotation of the orbits or canthal dystopia. If we look at the AP change, again, the eye and the lower jaw are in the right place. And everything else, if you analyze this, this is set back to the same extent. Uh, so what this patient, uh, and, and again, if we look at the vertical changes, uh, there's no vertical problem here. The height of the mid face is the same as the lower face. Uh, 
And so this is one of those rare patients who you can predict are going to get a good outcome from a monoblock uh, because you can only move the block monoblock forward. You, you can't really uh, put in vertical movement. So again, here she is during that distraction process. Uh, and this is following removal of the distractor. I don't know how long afterwards it was, maybe six months or so, but you can see the uh, uh, sig significant normalization of the face in the front view and particularly in the profile view. And again, if we put our uh, lines in, the only things that have stayed in the same place are the eyes and the chin, everything else has come forward. Um, now, of course, the difficulty with frontofacial monoblock is it's a very big operation. It's the biggest one we do in pediatric craniofacial congenital deformity surgery, I would suggest. Uh, you're all aware of the many potential complications of uh, craniofacial surgery, but um, uh, this just sort of illustrates effectively what we're doing. And this just happened to be a, a, an older patient where we did a monoblock and took a pre and post-op x-ray. And that shows you what we're doing um, uh, in hopefully a controlled and surgical way. But of course, if we try to do this with conventional surgery and do the movement on the table, we're going to have a big dead space between the dura and the back of the frontal bone flap. And of course, we've got a big defect in the skull base with uh, big communication a potential communication between the nose and the anterior fossa um, uh, with very high serious uh, complication rates uh, reported and a significant mortality um, uh, early on, uh, which can be reduced by using a pericranial flap to separate the anterior fossa from the nose. But what's really brought the complication rate down is the advent of distraction osteogenesis, because of course we can do this osteotomy cut, we're not creating dead space or big gaps in the skull base. Um, we can allow the dura to adhere to the frontal bone before we start the movements. We can allow the pericranial flap, flap to fibrose and settle. And of course, with distraction osteogenesis, you're stretching the bone and inducing callus formation, but you also get uh, soft tissue histiogenesis. So the soft tissue stretch gradually and adapt. Uh, and so it's really only distraction that's made this a viable procedure. But having said that, if there if there is a more conservative, safer way of achieving what we want to achieve um, and getting uh, as good a result, um, we would uh, usually adopt the safer procedure rather than the bigger, uh, more complication uh, prone procedure, because there is still a mortality rate associated with this operation. Um, Dunaway did a review a few years ago and found about 0 to 4 percent, but more recent re reports it was around 1 percent. So so it is a, a, a serious thing to consider, and we will only do it uh, if there's no other alternative. Uh, and I want to just briefly mention the Fort one osteotomy because I talked about that reduced maxillary growth, continued mand mandibular growth, and then re-emergence of that class three or prognathic jaw relationship and malocclusion. And this is very easy to deal with uh, uh, after skeletal growth is finished, about 17, 18 years of age with a Lefort one osteotomy. So you can see the maxilla and maxillary teeth have been brought forward. This is done by conventional surgery with uh, internal fixation and bone grafting. You don't need to distract the maxilla uh, in most craniofacial patients. Uh, and so that sort of completes the mid-phase treatment. And, and, at, and, and at the level of the teeth, uh, you can see that this is the patient we saw earlier, the APERTS patient. So with a combination of dental treatment of dental pathology, uh, orthodontic treatment, fixed brace treatment, um, uh, uh, extractions to uh, correct crowding, um, mid-phase advancement in one of its forms, and if necessary, a subsequent before one osteotomy, you can convert that malocclusion into something that's much more acceptable. And of course, this is an important aesthetic component of the outcome of uh, this treatment, as well as, chew, uh, as function in terms of chewing and biting uh, and speech articulation, which can be affected by a crowded um, uh, maxillary and mandibular uh, teeth and malocclusion. So um, that's just a very... The management of these patients. Uh, there's no single speciality that has a monopoly of uh, 
uh, experience, expertise and uh, techniques available to deal with all the problems these patients get. So we need a, 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 a good dedicated team of both surgical and non-surgical specialists, uh, of course, with close liaison with other surgeons. Talk. And uh, uh, if you can stop your screen share, probably we can get all the... Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry. Um, and, uh, stop request, share, yeah. And request yeah, there we are. on their video so that uh, we can have a good discussion. And uh, before I start the... Uh, thank you again, both of you. It was a wonderful talk. And before I throw open the uh, discussion, I would I have a few questions myself. Yeah. So I'll have the attention in the beginning. One is, uh, there are a few questions to Dr. Ajay. One was, what is the average reduction in ICP you see? The second question was, in your slide, one of your slides, you mentioned that you prefer to do the FOAR at 12 to 18 months. Generally, we prefer to do it at 6 to 12 months. So why the change? And the third thing was, how long do you distract in a posterior distraction? Uh, I'm sorry, you're. So, my yeah, I'm muting myself now. Sorry. Just, I was, hang on, just. Yes. Can you hear me now? Sorry, yeah, I had to. Yes. I kept my yeah. mic on. So, yes, I mean, what we have noticed, obviously, there has been very few uh, cases, you know, studies looking at objective drop in ICB uh, with the distraction. We have got experience about two cases uh, in the with, with this romantic uh, implantable device. And what we found that the pressure drops appreciably. And in fact, in one case, it went even into negative over a course of distraction. So, you know, the drop in pressure was dramatic. It started with something like 35, as I was mentioning in my talk, came down to 22 on table, which just about five to seven millimeter or less than a centimeter distraction. And over the course of the next two days, when we were expecting the pressure to go up, instead of going up, it started going down further. It came down within the normal range. And as we continue to distract and we would do a weekly monitoring of the pressure, the pressure were coming down to from high teens to mid teens to single digits. And we, by the time we finished distraction, after 27 days or 30 days, whatever time spray we use, you know, you can find that the pressures well, well within the zero to minus one. And then you, you could see that after a month or so, the pressure started creeping up again, but well within single digit. So that's been my experience of uh, doing dynamic ICP monitoring on posterior distraction. It's a it's experience of just two cases. We'll build up again and with a few more cases and put it in the literature. It's something which we are, will be publishing very soon for my unit. Uh, when do we start and how long we distract? I mean, the usual practice is to distract a millimeter a day for about 20 to 30 days because we tend to achieve between 20, uh, between around three centimeters, between two to three centimeters. Sometimes it's not possible to get the full length. I mean, Mr. Richardson will add to that because it sometimes becomes very tight. You know, you, you try and when you reach about 24, 25, you try and do the, uh, un, you know, twisting. It just refuses to move. And sometimes you have to accept that, you know, you have reached the limit of the distraction, despite there being some is still a bit of give on the distractors, if the child is not tolerating it. And if we have got a decent exp um, expansion, we stop. So we always aim to achieve between 2.5 to 3 centimeters of uh, distraction, depending upon the need of the case, as well as uh, the state of the distractors. Sometimes the distractors will break or become jammed, then you have to stop a bit early. With regards to um, the front orbital advancement timing, I think the standard practice in, our, in, the, in the UK is not to do them too early, because if you do them too early, there is a very high rate of reoperation. And this is quite, this been proven for across you know, from states where you know money is the main constraint. If the patient comes in, if they do it at about three months of age or about seven months of age, they don't have any fixed timing. And it's just to do with the rate of head growth. Find that the rate of head growth drops appreciably once you go past one year of age. So if you have to do any deformity correction, you are not you're going to get a good result if you are working on a moving goalpost. You know, if your head is growing so rapidly in the first one year of life, if you true any do any kind of a deformity correction, a frontal orbital advancement is a form of deformity correction. There are going to be a lot more chances of reoperation, and the results are not going to be optimal. So that's been our practice, and because we do so much of posterior distraction, 
we are a bit more relaxed and it gives a bit more time for the family to go through two major procedures you know don't forget that distraction takes a good 3 4 months out of the life you know you have to bring the child every week for about a month or month and a half you need to give them a bit of a break so this not a arbit you can do it at 12 months but the usual pattern from our experience is more towards 18 than towards 12 just because of the workload we have and it doesn't cause any a new problem to the patient i think the aesthetic results are better they would would chip on it if you know i'm sure they will agree with what i'm saying yeah and i think if if you've got a, a slightly older patient obviously the, the, there's just general surgical principles is a bigger patient they've got a bigger circulating volume you're less likely to have to transfuse uh, and if you do transfuse you can be able to limit the uh, number of donor exposures uh, the child will still have no memory of the procedure but from the point of view of the remodeling yeah you have more robust bone uh, and i think you can do a, a much more uh, sort of realistic um, remodeling um, with and be confident that your fixation is going to be retained by the bone and and, and of course there are the growth issues that aj pointed out so uh, and in fact because because of the constraints you know in terms of operating time and stuff that sort of thing I mean, I guess our, our window, time window, is actually nearer 18 to 24 months rather than right. 12 to 18 months because we uh, we struggle to fit everybody in um, uh, by 18 months. Uh, but but it doesn't have any detrimental effects on the results. And uh, I think, as AJ said, we if we we'd be concerned about recurrence if it if we operated too early. Parti of course, particularly in syndromic patients, it may be less of an issue. In the, in the non-syndromic cohort where recurrence is very rare in any case. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, I'd like to invite my fellow panelists, uh, any questions, comments? So basically my uh, question is, and I think I have uh, talked to Ajay about this earlier. There are two things. One, I agree that since posterior distraction, uh, uh, we actually do it one stage because uh, it's not easy to get uh, distractors and we try to put uh, small grafts in between and that has also worked reasonably well for us. But since uh, the posterior distraction has started, uh, our uh, timing of uh, frontoorbital advancement is usually about two years. That is absolutely true. And in uh, patients who do not have a severe exorbitism, Sometimes uh, you are surprised to see that uh, the second stage may not be required. And this has happened to us in a few patients. Yeah. Uh, there is a, a question regarding that as well. Can you do a single stage uh, kind of procedure? Have you ever attempted it or is it too difficult? Uh, uh, you, you just did all your cases in uh, with distractors. I think... In the initial experience was without distractors. So we have done in the past, and I'm sure Mr. Richardson would have more experience than I and have in this regards. But you know, but with the distractors, once we have noticed that the complications like bond or raised pressure, the need for shunts, the need for you know, and when you're doing a craniotomy, the incidence of dural tear, underlying brain damage, and you know, post-op complication like pseudo seal and you know. All this, that has come down. The neurosurgical complications of, the, of craniofacial surgery are the ones which really <laughs> stress, stress you out. That has definitely come down. It's doable, and I'm sure there is a small group of um, Cruzon's patient who are not that severely affected, and they would perhaps present to you so late that you do have missed the window for a posterior distraction, and you may be able to do a thing one stage front orbital advancement on them. But the numbers are few and far between. Perhaps we have a better, better pickup rate and a much more efficient referral system as well. I'll just ask one more question before I uh, make way for other panelists. And uh, have you ever gone into the posterior fossa at all to do any kind of decompression in these patients? Yes. Uh, in fact, I presented my small series in the European Neurosurgery meeting in Rome. You were there in that meeting. We presented our series of six cases where we were doing one stage posterior vault expansion with distraction and using the same incision, going subperiosteal and doing a under the microscope extradural foramen migram decompression. It's challenging. And it's, you know, you are working in a very narrow window. You know, if it's okay, everything is going fine. But if you get a bit of bleeding, 
there you are in a state of panic you don't know where you are and i would have stopped doing it i used to do them when i was a bit younger but i don't want to so raise do my blood pressure there is an indication for such a procedure there is an indication for where there is severe um, uh, carry decompression carry uh, herniation to the centimeters because they are, those are not going to uh, slip back into the fossa fossa what happens to those cases when you create space in the fossa fossa this is something i can only go by my experience of one or two cases the carry which is herniated tends to uh, become glyotic and tends to wither away so the by, by default you find that actually the dead brain it kinds of wither away and opens up the actual physical movement of the carry back in the posterior fossa is very uncommon i mean if you look at the birmingham paper that first 20 23 cases i think they had actual physical movement of the carry back into the posterior fossa only in two cases so it's, it's mostly this uh, the tonsils shrink away because of chronic herniation and lack of blood supply and uh, the pressure on the posterior fossa and the brain stem gets lifted up so the central apnea improves because of it. in these kind of patients did you ever have to go back and do a separate foreign magnum decompression yes i've done it in one case not in the ones with distraction i don't think maybe there is one case who developed a yes i have done it in one case developed we started developing syringomyelia and the string started getting worse in that case only one case i have to do it just one more question about the third ventricular ostomy patient which you showed mm-hmm. uh do you think it would have worked without a distraction good question I and mean, if you look at that particular scan there's hardly any space in front of the brain stem you know it's just i doing a pure thrust of third ventricular ostomy alone i would be surprised if it would work it just providing the distraction so you, you would just... consider it as a pre uh, distraction procedure i have not done it as a pre distraction so far uh, the oxford jj mon has done one or two where he has done it as a pre distraction i tend to do them more you know just as a fire fighting to take care of any csf leak or if the hydrocephalus still persists i tend to do them to avoid a shunt not as a primary procedure to avoid a distractor rather than to supplement a distraction i just wanted to bring the point up of uh, venous hypertension mm-hmm. and would it work at all first uh, i mean i have not done it but uh, just wanted to yeah but, find out your experience if you but with venous hypertension the problem is with venous hypertension it's so hard to measure venous hypertension you know we we know for sure and i can tell you in one particular case you know once again these are based on uh, experience of one case or two case the one case where we have we had a child with you know who was waiting to have a uh, who had a uh, sutureectomy done had a shunt put in and i had strictly said don't you know revise when you revise the shunt don't put in anything other than a programmable uh, shunt set at 130 or 120 on the cotman hakim system and this was when we were out for the ispn meeting in pasadena 2009 10 and i came back and the child had a shunt block and one of my colleagues decided that it was a waste of money putting in a 2000 pounds uh, re implant again because the valve was blocked he put in an ordinary one and within no time what was a normal posterior fossa became a crowded posterior fossa the child who was on the ward went on to ventilator and you can see the carry descend down in no time within 3 days this happened and all they had to do was to just tie the shunt or externalize the shunt and it stop the cs block and the child improved so venous hypertension does play a significant part perhaps we do not um, realize how important it is only when we face it then we realize yes it is a problem i think i might show it in one of the meetings that particular scan it would be quite uh, interesting to yes. uh, see that i remember too. the name of the patient because it's gone to back to sheffield to a uh, name sex sena who is a neurosurgeon there who looks after the patient now <laughs> well over to uh, uh, pramod and uh, dr rao yeah uh, thank you um, brilliant presentation by both of you and it's so heartening to see the kind of synergy that both of you worked together and um, you know the results were fantastic uh, my question to both of you is um, i think one of the key things is the vector planning and um, to get the vectors right how much of virtual planning do you do and i saw dr the preference for the red or the halo kind of distractors 
how many times do you use the buried distractors or resorbable distractors which are also there in the market today i think uh, yeah we uh, david so we 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 for, for mid face distraction we only use the 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 rigid external distractor uh we haven't used resorbable distractors we don't use internal distractors for the for the mid face i don't know if that question was about mid face or whether it was Absolutely. about the posterior distraction uh just for the mid face for, for the mid face yeah so we we don't use internal distractors at all and the reason we use the red frame well there's a, there's a few reasons but the main one is that 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 you you don't have to plan your vectors in any sort of formal uh, virtual way um you know we plan our vectors as i've described Just go along. Okay. Uh, it, it, it's not particularly scientific but the but the nice thing about the the red uh, frame is that you can alter the vectors as you go along so it, you know if we think we need a bit more vertical change we can just loosen loosen the the, the, the little screws that retain it we can lengthen it uh, and reset it so we, so you have a lot of flexibility you don't have to set the vectors at the start um, I mean you do set the vectors at the start but you can change them unlike an internal distractor where where if, if the vectors are wrong then you're back to the operating theater to um, to another fairly invasive procedure to uh, to collect that. Uh, I mean, they look quite dramatic, but but children tolerate these incredibly well. Uh, our nurse specialists will go into the school to talk to the teachers, talk to the other kids in the class, and so on. They'll show them the distractor. They get shown pictures of their face with the distractor, sort of photoshopped in situ, so they know what it's going to be like. And actually. Uh, some of them, you know, become little celebrities in their school because they've got this big <laughs> thing on there. They, they are very well tolerated, actually. You wouldn't think so to look at them, but they are. So, so that's why we haven't used internal distractors for, for these mid-face uh, procedures. Uh, I mean, you, you know, uh, other units in the UK do. Uh, it's just that we choose not to, and, that, and they're the reasons why. Now, my personal preference also is the RED external distractors. Um, I've been using it mainly for uh, post cleft cases where we are trying to yep. bring all the, uh, but yep. craniofacial, very few I have done. Uh, but yep. one concern what I have is, uh, have you had any issues with the pins getting loosened or getting dislodged? Because these are very, very, you know, thin skulls and, uh, you yep. know, abnormal skulls. Yeah, um, we, we, we absolutely have um, uh, both of those things. And, and what we, uh, and we've had pins migrating through the skull into the dura um, and you have to be very careful because as you rightly say you know uh, many of these kids have thin skulls uh, they may have persistent bony defects from previous surgery and so on so you have to be very careful and what we used to say to the patients is um, you know if they become loose just give them a, make them finger tight again just just get the parents to tighten them up again uh, but we've had a few cases where they'd come in uh, the pin's been a centimetre or two through the bone, uh, and we certainly had one who um, who had uh, uh, cerebritis and fits because of that. So mm -hmm. yes, you do have to be careful, and, uh, and and you know we supervise them pretty well. Uh, we see them uh, once a week, um, and and we don't tell the patients to do anything to the to the to the pins if they need tightening. We'll tighten them to make sure that they're not um, going through. So, but yes, of course they have problems, but usually they're fairly mild. Um, um, you know, most, pe most parents look after the pin sites very well. Uh, and it certainly hasn't been a major issue aside from those that migrate through the bone. Uh, and then of course, that's, uh, that's an issue, isn't it? Excellent, uh, thank you. I think there's a question related to this in the chat box uh, to Mr. David. So the question is, uh, how do you plan the vector on posterior wall distraction and also your opinion on simulation surgery in these complex cases, considering the post-surgical soft tissue changes? Yeah, I, I don't know if AJ wants to answer the posterior distraction question. Uh, basically, we just do it parallel with the Frankfurt plane. In, in, in other words, it's parallel with the horizontal plane with the head in its natural position. Um, it's not something that we plan in detail. We don't plan it. We, we just assess it on the operating table. Um, I, I don't think that, that the vector is um, has to be particularly, um, what's the word, accurate. I mean, it does have to be accurate. Uh, and as AJ said, uh, you have to make sure the distractors are 
parallel and, and taking the bone in the direction you want. But we don't feel there's any need for any preoperative formal planning other than looking at the patient and looking at the scans uh, and deciding what we want to do. AJ, I don't know if you want yeah, to comment. On that. Just to it, because it's, more, it's uh, where you're going to put the, exactly the distractors is largely decided by the quality of the bone as well. And in, if you have very thin bone, then you may have to move it up and down on the table. So you, as much as you plan pre-op, actual site of the distractor is decided mm -hmm. when you go on and do the craniotomy. And you find that you need to put the, your plates at a site of very good quality bone. You don't want to put it in an area where the bone is too thin or you know, is not of the right quality. So you, know, you can do as much as simulation before, but you have to do it on the table. Right? And what David said, we try and get it as parallel as possible. But it's, it's, it's arbitrary. It's not something which you can plan beforehand. You have to do it on the table and we, you know, make sure that the vectors are moving in the right direction. Uh, and a small thing to add to, you know, for I think the Great Ormond Street, when they're doing monoblocks in children, if they had to put pins in for the rigid break, they were putting in a bit of a mesh, titanium mesh, mm -hmm. to just provide a bit of extra strength so that the pins do not go through the head. Because as David quite rightly mentioned, we had had patients who had mild cerebritis, we needed a course of antibiotics because the pin head went through the, in, through the dura into the brain. And we had a tiny temporal of cerebritis almost turning into an abscess, which was managed with antibiotics. Can I add to the uh, the vector to a posterior distraction? Yeah. Am I audible? Yeah, you are. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, what we do, I, I think even Suhas is here present. Uh, I'm the maxillofacial surgeon. Suhas is the neuro guy. So uh, what uh, I try to do or what we try to do when we place the distractor is to try to keep the distractor as uh, much as in the center of the flap. Right. And uh, it's not only the posterior movement. If you want to address the, uh, the turicophaly, you need to get a vector that is slightly backward and slightly downward so that you can bring the vertex. If your cut is at the, at the top of the skull, then if you bring the flat backward and downward, you can get the posterior uh, skull uh, more aesthetic. You can bring the turicophaly down. And uh, in, in our experience, even if the skull is very soft, if you put more screws, it doesn't get dislodged. And you don't have to get a complete perfect, uh, uh, complete torque you know, into the bone. If it, is, uh, if it takes the bite, that is good enough. I put more screws uh, and that will hold the distractor. Well, we use the same uh, posterior calvarial distractor uh, that uh, KLS Mark introduces. The advantage of uh, that particular distractor is that it doesn't, it has a slight play on the plate so that, uh, you know, the, the distractor doesn't stand out of the skull, which can be very, uh, you know, difficult for the parents to manage. So what uh, we try to do is to keep the distractor as close to the skull as possible. And uh, that does not occur so that the distractor stands out and away from the skull, keep it as close to the, center of the flap as possible and get the vector slightly downwards so that you can bring the height of the skull down okay and uh, put more screws uh, if you can and uh, the thickness is fair at times we have put the distractors uh, on uh, skull which is a millimeter thick and it stays it doesn't come off mm -hmm. because once the uh, the hooks of the distractor the distractor arms have hooks takes hold uh, it stays and intraoperatively we we turn the distractor so that it engages. So we uh, do around two millimeters of distraction on table. One is to get an immediate release of the pressure and two, so that the distract, it's not only the screws that hold the distractor, it's the hooks of the distractor that engage to the edges of mm -hmm. the bone that will hold it in position. And then uh, just to continue, uh, uh, we, uh, do not wait for a latency period uh, in our unit. Uh, we do not have a latency period. We start distraction on table and continue uh, uh, the next day onwards. And these distractors are 25 millimeter distractor. Uh, as much as possible, we distract. We try to distract the full length of the distract that is 25 millimeters, unless it produces a 
you know, a very large uh, aesthetic uh, deformity in the back of the skull. I mean, it's just, it, I, just to add to what you said, we had one particular case where the bone was of such poor quality that to put the distractors, we had to take a, a, a chunk of parietal bone, split it into its half, and use a bone graft and put the, uh, the screws through, that, uh, through the bone graft uh, as an onlay bone graft. It was uh, such poor quality. You know, some of the severely raised pressure, you know, the, the, the screws don't hold. I mean, David will have more to say on that because I don't stay back to put the distractor screws in. <laughs> I leave it to them to, mm -hmm. you know, they are the experts in that area. It's not my area of expertise. But I mean, that particular case, I remember because the, my uh, plastic surgery colleague was struggling to put the, the, this, uh, the uh, screws on. I had, was called back to take a bit of bone graft so that they could put an all lay bone graft to hold the plates in position. It was that thin a bone. So just a small little uh, technical tidbit, it might work out for you guys. If you can. Yeah. And regarding consolidation, uh, we have started removing the distractor much earlier. There, I mean, it's pro probably uh, the corona times. And there was this particular child who had come from uh, Punjab and, uh, the, and they had to stay in quarantine. And then uh, we, uh, we had done the posterior calvarial distraction and then uh, for them to go back and then again come back for a mid-phase procedure would have been, you know, would have been difficult. We don't know how much time the corona was going to go on. So uh, we decided to do the frontal uh, orbital advancement at the same time as the distractor removal. So uh, we practically removed the distractor uh, 10 days uh, following the last distraction. And then uh, at the same time did the FOIR, right? And, uh, and the Oxford people talk about this. They talk about removing the distractor, posterior distractor much earlier because it is unlike the mid-phase distraction where you, know, you are pushing against uh, uh, the soft tissue and if you remove it early, it relapses. Here you have a posterior fossa that is already crowded. And the moment you release it, the brain is going to push uh, the bone back, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, the the you distract the bone two centimeters. It's not that you're going to have a void there. It's the brain that is going to expand along with the distraction and take that place. So even if you take the distractor out, the, the, the brain is going to hold that bone in position. So we don't go with the, uh, the, uh, the regular conventional principles of distraction of mid-phase where you have to have that consolidation period uh, to, you know, uh, keep the distractor on for two to three months uh, and then take it out. It can be taken out much earlier. Okay. I mean, that's, that's a point worth noting here. Yeah. I don't know what David have to say. I mean, we haven't taken them out much earlier other than when their distractors have been broken or something have come out. We have taken them out once or twice, but we have gone in and put in uh, uh, stabilizing plates in yeah. some cases. Yeah. yeah but, but I mean, I, I agree with that point that that you know you've got the the tissues underneath holding it in place so i'm sure you don't need the same consolidation uh period um and i guess i suppose you know we just be a little bit worried if the child's lying on the back of the head and you know whether that would have an effect because of course we know that people get deformational plagiocephaly don't we and that's just pressure of the pillow or at least young kids do so if you've got malleable uh, relatively floating bones but 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 yeah it's the point's well taken that that you expand and you know the jaw is going to expand and it's going to yeah. maintain likely to maintain the position yeah uh speaking on posterior distraction there's a question from the audience for dr ajay uh, uh the question was in posterior distraction do you do only the bony cuts or do you lift the entire cut bone and then distract it no, no, just the bony cuts. You don't have to lift the bone at all. Just the bony cuts. The important bit is to do the posterior cut in the midline, where you saw the sign is. That I always drill and do it with, uh, do the final cut with the up cuts, you know, with the keratin ranges. You know, we don't lift the bone. That's actually, technically, it's a, not that challenging compared to other, other procedures we in cranial facial surgery. You don't have to lift the bone at all. And do you do an MRV for all these syndromic... Uh... 
you know stuff is we do it's, it's as part of our initial workup they also have a mri mrv done for all the cases so when we ask for a initial mri scan generally we tend to do a full craniospinal with mri mrv to the full body now you can one could argue do we need to do a mri spine for the rest of the syndromic but we have found a quite a few cases where they have tethered cord or they have other distorted anomalies so we always tend to win because they're going to have it under general anesthesia might as well use the uh, the anesthesia to do a full screening of the craniospinal axis so we do a mri mrv along with the, the craniospinal mri plus a ct uh, there's another question to david this uh, you uh, he he is asking when do you uh, try to do the dental malocclusion uh, when is the preferred time for correcting the mal- malocclusions uh the, well, the final correction is after skeletal growth so so in a girl 16 17 in a boy 17 18, 18 something like that um we know we know from uh, you know non syndromic orthognathic surgery that if you uh, operate while the skeleton's still growing you're going to lose some of the effect because as i said it's the mandible that's the last thing to uh finish growing so um where the where the uh, upper jaw is uh, failing to catch or keep up with the mandible if you operate early you can expect a degree of relapse because of that future unfavorable uh, growth and of course you know in the context of cr- syndromic craniosynostosis we usually uh, it's usually class 3 jaw relationship in other words the the, the mid face the, the maxilla set behind the mandible so so early uh, occlusal correction um uh you know wouldn't be appropriate but of course all the other stages contribute to that ultimate occlusal correction so this is an ongoing process with the uh, extractions orthodontics uh, as i said the mid face and then that final orthognathic the fourth one osteotomy or by maxillary osteotomy or whatever is required uh, later on but actually many patients don't need that some do but the final correction yeah is is after skeletal growth is complete uh the, i think there are two more questions to dr ajay and uh, one was what are the limits of your posterior cranial wall distraction and is there any need to go intratocular and another question was a single stage posterior wall expansion without distraction your opinion on that single stage i mean do we need to go intratocular uh, that is a big question i mean honestly i don't think so because you know you, what you're trying to do is expand the skull and buy yourself space if you got a sizable craniotomy and most of the time you do a very big craniotomy we don't have to really look for the torcular to go down and create more stress for yourself but if you are really if you find that the posterior fossa is extremely tight in the good old days you know we were talking about when we started the procedure i used to do an extradural bony decompression of the foramen magnum but the need for it has been less and less and i don't feel that you know once I stop doing them i have had any bad outcome with any of the patient not that i do all of them because there are two other neurosurgeons who do it so you don't have to go intratorcular if you got a big expansion the idea is to expand uh, take a cranial uh, cerebral disproportion and what is the second question i forgot the question was a single stage posterior wall distraction versus that's I, right i i put that question up earlier so yeah we, okay i mean there, there are so many ways to skin a cat i mean if you look at the practice in the uk the great ormond street doesn't put in distractors at all they are doing on table distractors with springs so you know there's something can be done you know it's just a amount of distraction you can achieve and the amount of you know cranial cerebral disproportion you are able to achieve with with the spring versus versus a controlled distraction with uh, distractors i think that what really decides but the rotterdam group and great ormond street they using only springs for to save wall expansion they're not using distractors so in principle yes is doable in fact in, if you look at the japanese some of the japanese group what they're doing is they're putting in posterior distractors to expand the back of the head they bring the patient back after the phase of consolidation they're removing the distractor and in the same sitting they're doing putting the distractors for anterior vault expansion so they're doing a front orbital with the with distractors in the same anesthesia just to reduce the number of anesthetic exposures to the child now i'll be personally not very keen on doing it because these are very messy uh, 
you know there are mucky areas which we, which you don't want to go in again in the same city you potentially increase the risk of infection but they're doing it and they're getting away with it so there are so many ways of doing the same procedure it's, a, it's always an ev evolution isn't it because when i started when i was training we didn't do anything to the back of the head then it was a posterior release just a simple craniotomy cut and let the icp push the bone back and then we sort of push the bone back and fix it and and maybe do a bit of remodeling and then distraction came along and it's a new technique and so everything has to be done by distraction but i'm not sure that's necessarily true uh, as with any other new te technique it has its advantages and disadvantages and, and going back a step in that evolutionary process may well not be inappropriate and may not disadvantage many patients. Absolutely. So that is what I was just mentioning that, you know, see, when we used to wait for two months or three months for uh, consolidation uh, after PCBD, uh, we used to take the patient back and it's an anesthesia, extra anesthesia and it's extra cost, right? So we tried to fit in two surgeries at the same time. So anyway, you have to expose the, you know, you have to get adequate exposure to remove the, remove the distractor. So it's just raise the entire coronal and finish the frontal battle advancement at the same time. So it cuts down the cost, cuts down one extra anesthesia for the child. So in case if the frontal is not so bad, but if the child uh, has a uh, bad mid phase. Uh, with uh, significant uh, obstructive sleep apnea, uh, we uh, do the mid-phase distraction at the same time as uh, posterior calvarial device removal. That is at six months. So that is also an option. So we try to uh, put surgeries together and reduce anesthesia and reduce cost because of our you know, situation. Sure. I don't think anybody is doing, I mean, David, you can correct me. Is there anybody doing a mid-phase advancement to at six months of age, I don't think anywhere else anybody is doing it. I may be wrong. Uh, I, well, I'm not in, I, not that I'm aware of, not in the UK. I mean, there's very high complication rate if you do yeah. it at that age, isn't there? Yeah. The bone is so thin. We, I don't, have, I don't know. we have a series of uh, more than 25 oh, cases now where we do not internal, not red, but we use transfacial pin distractors. It's a very simple device, right? Mm. So it's a uh, before three cut. And it can be done uh, even without uh, uh, as a separate procedure through small uh, facial incisions. You do uh, uh, lifo 3 osteotomy, put the transfacial pin, and then there is a foot plate that comes on the central bone, and then you distract. So uh, the idea is you can avoid tracheosmy, right? You know, the child has to stay on tracheosmy. And we have had up to five years of follow up with these children. You can, if you get try to, uh, if you can get them to tide over that age of up to five to six years uh, with uh, reasonably good airway, reasonably good oxygenation, they are good. Either it is the air comes through the tracheosmia or comes through the nose, right? So uh, distraction uh, helps. Uh, it can be done in pediatric uh, population uh, less than one year of age. The youngest we have done is at four months and uh, without complications, so it works. Yeah. I mean, maybe we are much more aggressive with coronal dilatation, so we don't have that much issues with um, airway. We can, the airway management has definitely improved lips and bombs in the last 10, 15 years compared to what it was even in the early part of the last decade. You know, everyone used to have a tracheostomy. I think the number of tracheostomies has definitely gone down big time. I can't remember the last tracheostomy I've seen on a craniofacial patient in the last five years. With serial coronal dilatation, you know, we are managing the airway much, much better. Yeah, and probably an, an additional advantage would be uh, globe protection as well, because yeah. obviously you do that, you, know, uh, you can avoid globe subluxations and you know, corneal exposures and uh, exposure keratitis. Any other questions? Any other comments? Uh, just wanted to ask you, uh, Mr. Richardson, uh, have you had major speech problems at all after significant amount of um, advancement for your Cruzens or Appert syndrome? Uh, yeah, yes, we have. Mostly in Appert syndromes with repaired clefts of the palate. If, if there's an intact palate, our experience is that the palate will adapt. And it usually takes about six months for 
uh, vilophangial incompetence if it's if it's going to be temporary to settle uh, but of course in apex with a with a repaired cleft you don't have that pliability of the soft palate so of, of course they all get um, detailed speech and language assessments nasal endoscopies to try to you know sort of predict that of course you can't uh, uh, and they're all warned that you know hyper nasal speech may be a side effect of the uh, of the procedure so yes of course we have but but mostly in aperts with clefts mm -hmm. uh, so i think we have answered all the questions on the uh, chat and the question and answer session um so if there are no more questions uh, shall we end the this one yeah so uh, i would like to thank again uh, uh, Dr. Ajay Sinha and Mr. David Richardson for the wonderful presentations and for accepting to share their experience at such a short notice. Uh, thank you again, both of you. Uh, it's been a pleasure having you. I'd also like to thank my fellow panelists, Professor Deo Pujari, Dr. Girish and Dr. Pramod for their active participation and uh, insights into this management of this complex uh, problem. And also like to thank the uh, folks at uh, INTAS who have sponsored this and the uh, committee of the Indi Indian Society of Pediatric Neurosurgery who made this possible. Uh, I would like to thank all of you and uh, I'd like to end the session now. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. On, the, on the website. Thank you so much. You. Yeah, That's and good. all thank the participants, you. this is going to be available as a recording. So perhaps you can watch it on YouTube again. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you.